to the final session of the Law As Conference. Um, this session is Instantiations, Law, Sovereignty, Justice. So I'm trying to figure out how justice wound up here and not elsewhere. I think maybe justice is everywhere. I'm, I bet I'm an optimist, as I previously said. The idea behind this session, building on Chris's idea, but not trying to palm it off on him, is that these papers invite us to think about the history of law when we imagine law not in relation to something else, but as something else. And the something else that these papers imagine law as, or as law, are uh, law as peace, and peace with a, a technical meaning that, um, and a, an interesting meaning that Laura Edwards will talk about. Law is a framework for the moral limits on methods of warfare. Law is a framework for establishing sovereignty over territory occupied by non-European peoples. Being a bit more concrete, these papers, um, particularly the ones that talk about the United States, uh, but also Mariana's paper, all portray law as a crucial legitimating device in exercises of extremely violent power. Um, and yet to bringing a certain kind of peace and legitimacy, perceived peace and legitimacy to that power, in an area where the state seems quite weak. And thus the question of what we mean by law seems very much to the point. Uh, Mariana's paper, of course, does so too, except that it examines the use of law, as I see it, retrospectively uh, to challenge land claims that were once achieved through the kinds of power that Paul's paper describes. There's all sorts of other interesting things to be said about the papers individually and collectively, but that is Bob Gordon's job. I won't take his job from him because I couldn't do it nearly as well. Uh, to introduce our panelists, Laura Edwards is a professor of history at Duke and happily returns to being just a very eminent professor of history from a number of positions in administration that she held when I was there. She is the author of numerous articles on gender and the law in the 19th century South, as well as two books, Gendered Strife and Confusion, The Political Culture of Reconstruction, and Scarlet Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Southern Women in the Civil War Era. This paper is part of her new book project, The People and Their Peace, Legal Culture and the Transformation of Inequality in the Post-Revolutionary South, which deals with the re reconfiguration of ordinary people's relationship to law and governance in the years 1787 to 1840. John Fabian Witt is Alan H. Duffy, class of 1960, professor of law at Yale Law School, a title almost as long as Dirk's. Um, he is also uh, recently announced a Guggenheim Fellowship recipient for next year. Congratulations, John. He is the author of Patriots and Cosmopolitans, Hidden Histories of American Law, which explores law and nationhood at key moments in American history from the founding to the Cold War. And also another book, The Accidental Republic, Crippled Working Men, Destitute Widows, and the Remaking of American Law. His writings have also appeared in the most elite American law reviews and in other publications that some of you all might have read, the New York Times, Slate, and the Washington Post. This paper is part of his new book on the law of war in American history from the revolution to the turn of the 20th century. Paul Freimer is Associate Professor of Politics at Princeton and uh, for the current academic year is the acting director of Princeton's Program in Law and Public Affairs, which is Princeton's law school, as it were. A law school without law students, how cool is that? Um, actually, I love my students, so I wouldn't do it without them. Um, he is the author of two books, Uneasy Alliances, Race and Party Competition in America, and Black and Blue, African Americans, the Labor Movement, and the Decline of the Democratic Party both of which were published by Princeton University Press. It was just destined that he was going to wind up at Princeton. He's just Princeton all over the place. Uh, he, <laughs> he teaches and writes on democratic representation, race and civil rights, and labor and employment, including on issues as diverse as legal understandings of political parties, the racial politics of Hurricane Katrina, and affirmative action, and the role of law in the historical development of American territorial expansion. 
Mariana Valverde is a professor of criminology at the University of Toronto, although calling her criminology doesn't begin to cover. She's the professor of everything. Um, she is the author of so many books and articles on such a diversity of ideas that it's not even possible to summarize them. Generally, her fields of inquiry include social and legal theory, socio-legal studies, and historical sociology. Currently, she's writing a book tentatively titled Everyday Law in the World's Most Diverse City, based on five years of empirical and legal research documenting how the city of Toronto uses legal tools at its disposal, both to enforce and not to enforce bylaws, and to manage disputes. Uh, and she has a whole slew of other really interesting and diverse projects and, as I said, has written a number of books, including most recently, Law and Order, Signs, Meanings, Myths, um, uh, and The New Police Science, The Police Power in Domestic and International Governance, and with Peter Goodrich, uh, Nietzsche and Legal Theory, Half-Written Laws. The commentator uh, is Bob Good. Sorry, Bob Gordon, the <laughs> Chancellor Kent Professor of Law and Legal History at Yale, and then he has a separate uh, chair in the history department, so maybe your title is even longer, at least according to the Yale website you do. Uh, <laughs> and it did, perhaps not. Um, uh, his subject areas are contracts, American legal history, evidence, the legal profession, and law and globalization. He too has published so much and so widely that one cannot begin to summarize. And indeed, even if you look him up on the Yale Law or History Department websites, his selection of his works uh, that appear on each site is both brief and characteristically self-deprecating and humorous. Um, so I was amused to discover that his selections for the history department are the legacy of all of Wendell Holmes, and um, I need my colleague Joe Demento to pronounce this, it's in Italian, Storie Critiche del Diritto, Critical Legal History, it's the version in Italian. Uh, and for the law school, two articles and book chapters on the legal profession, and of course the one that many people in this group know best, Critical Legal History, is in the Stanford Law Review, one of the few law review articles I ever read that really changed my life. Um, delighted, <coughs> let's hear from Laura. I clearly need to update my web page. The book is out, so um, if, if I refer to this as if it's out, it's because it's out. Um, so, in the research for my recent book, I stumbled over, oh, before I want to start, I wanted to say also that picking up on Ariella's comment from yesterday, I often give elements of this paper at, for women's history audiences in terms of the way that the law is gendered, the way our construction of understanding where authority comes from and how it's structured is very gendered. And I didn't do that for this context, but just to let you know that that's out there, and if anybody wants to ask questions about it, I'd be glad to uh, comment. So, in the research for my recent book, I stumbled over the piece, a well-established Anglo-American concept that expressed the ideal order of the metaphorical public body. As the term stumble suggests, the encounter was entirely unplanned. My research focused on public legal matters in the post-revolutionary South, and I had been working with the presumption that cases in the local courts would follow the logic laid out in statutes and appellate decisions, at least loosely, and this was apparently wildly optimistic on my part, because they did not at all, a finding that actually should not have come as a surprise. It is a commonplace in the, liter in the literature that the provincialism of local courts often resulted in mystifying verdicts at odds with statutes and appellate law. I have proceeded with local courts anyway because I'm a perversely stubborn individual, <clears throat> And I was certain that the conventional wisdom said more about the limitations of the historiography than it did actually about the promises of the evidence. So I persevered, and several years and several thousand cases later, however, the gaping divide between local court records and state law became impossible for even me to ignore. So I reconciled myself to it. But instead of dismissing the local level as problematic because it did not follow state law, I set about finding the logic that governed this part of the legal system. At that point, the answer seemed almost all too obvious, one of those moments where you hit yourself up, upside the head and go, oh my god, why didn't I see this before? Virtually all of the documents clearly stated the legal concept that guided these cases, the preservation of the peace. 
The logic of the piece and its importance within the post-revolutionary legal system accord to the findings of recent scholarship, which emphasize the relative underdevelopment of law and government at the state and national levels in this era, and highlight the significance of local institutions and personal networks in the dynamics of law and governance. The question for legal historians, however, is not just whether the local level was more important than the state and national levels in this period of US history. The piece is about conceptions of law, not just the places where law resided. Ultimately, the logic of the piece is more important than the places where it was practiced, even, because that logic challenges and historicizes and really reframes, I think, the conceptual separation of law and society, a separation that structures the field at a very basic level. Legal historians study the law as a distinct topic, which seems kind of obvious, actually. But it is difficult to isolate the law in matters governed by the peace. In fact, the piece thoroughly integrated law and society because the emphasis was on maintaining the social order as it was defined actually in very particular concrete contexts in local areas. In a legal process woven into the texture of social relations, law both guided and emerged from the dynamics of people's lives. Legal principles were subordinate to the social results, defined as a just outcome that restored order as it was defined in particular contexts. Just as the piece encompassed both law and society, it merged other dynamics that legal historians tend to separate into different, if not oppositional, categories. The piece acknowledged and accepted conflict, even as it sought to restore consensus. It incorporated dissent and change, even as it sought to maintain the status quo. It responded to individuals and highly personal complaints, even as it ignored completely individual rights. And it included a wide range of people in its workings, even as it sought to uphold rigid hierarchies of the post-revolutionary social order. If law is not distinct from society, though, what is legal history? The logic of the piece, particularly its conflation of law and society, raises important questions about what the law is, where it is made, and how to follow its history. Those questions have both historical and conceptual implications. And by that, I mean it, it helps us rethink what actually, I think, took place on the ground in the early 19th century. But I think it also poses challenges to legal historians in the ways they think more broadly about how to conceptualize legal history. In historical terms, the piece played a significant role in defining the content of public law in the post-revolutionary period, because the institutional organization of the law was different then than it is today and the local level of the legal system had not been clearly subordinated to the state and national level. So what happened at the local level actually was a law in a way that we have really not particularly come to grips with. That historical moment has passed. It is no longer. But the importance of the piece in this period, that period, alters the terrain on which legal historians today work and suggests new ways to structure our narratives of historical change more generally. In a broader conceptual sense, the logic of the piece reveals distinct limits in the way we now define the law in opposition to those things associated with society. Society is a powerful concept in our historical frameworks. Among other things, it provides a binary point of reference that offers an explanation for every complication that does not fit our definition of law. Not only, I think, for historians, but also for people on the ground today, right? And we saw that in Chris's paper. And so this definition of law clarifies what the law is and negates the need for further analysis of it, or its opposition to society clarifies what the law is and negates our need to actually analyze it. The logic of the piece, which integrated law and society without actually erasing the distinction between the two, su suggests that this conceptual binary is anything but normative. More than that, the piece suggests that this binary comes at a cost, narrowing and isolating the field of legal history. Like other legal historians, I began my research assuming the presence of the law, somewhere of the law, and I was sort of assuming that it was actually a readily identifiable body of rules enforced uniformly by centralized institutional structures. Seems pretty reasonable. It was an assumption, however, fraught with difficulties because this kind of legal system did not actually exist in the post-revolutionary South, or for that matter, most of the United States at this time. Now, <coughs> I'm not the first person to notice this, and while acknowledging the situation, Often, legal historians usually deal with it by focusing on the development of what we want, but so often fail to find. We focus on evidence that affirms the growth of unified bodies of law and centralized institutional structures. If we can't find them, we can at least talk about their beginnings. And there's nothing inherently wrong with studying law in these terms. 
Such a legal system does, in fact, emerge in the United States, and so it makes sense to chart its evolution. This approach, however, becomes problematic when it ignores the accompanying conceptual baggage, which is packed with assumptions about the nature of law and its production, not all of which are useful. The bags are so full that there's really not much room for anything else, particularly contradictory or even complicating evidence. In fact, legal historians tend to explain away such evidence in terms of fit. We label these circumstances undeveloped, backward, dysfunctional, or utterly different, the unfortunate results of social forces that delayed or distorted the law's development. Those conclusions are satisfying only insofar as they do not force a reconsideration of the conceptual framework that led us to them in the first place. The results, I think, have circumscribed the field, excluding entire time periods and areas of the country from the narrative outlooks, including, for instance, the first half or more of US history, the South, areas of the Midwest and West during formative periods of settlement, states that retain French or Spanish legal traditions, all local jurisdictions, and almost everyone without legal training or not involved in litigation. And the exclusions then generate hierarchies. Case law and legislation at the state and national levels constitute law in a way that local legal matters do not. The Northeast, and perhaps the Midwest, can represent the trajectory of legal change in the United States as a whole, but the South and the West cannot. These exclusions and hierarchies rely, to some degree, on the conceptual separation of law and society. That framework has been both the source of analytical inspiration and heated debate among legal historians, and for good reason. It is resilient because it structures the basic concepts that define legal history as a field. The backdrop of society provides the means for identifying the law and of charting its complicated development. The scholarship that places law and society in a dynamic relationship has, in fact, reshaped the terrain of the field by joining these two sides, as well as dealing with its interesting relationship and its oppositions. But society also provides a convenient conceptual place to put all of the challenging issues we would rather avoid. The resulting tensions structure key debates in the field, such as the growth of the state and the reach of state authority, just to name two. Even legal historians who question the binary, like myself, till, still tend to reproduce it because the terms are so difficult to escape. We depend on it to explain what we study. As legal historians, we write about the law. We need an identifiable topic, the law, in order to be legal historians. But we need to examine how we define it. In particular, framing the law as a unified concept, defined in opposition to society, comes at a cost, one that narrows the terms of our scholarship by locating the law in some places and not in others. And we don't even then look for the law in those other places. The logic of the piece, as practiced in local jurisdictions in the post-revolutionary South, provides a more comprehensive framework in which to conceptualize the law. So first, what was the piece? The piece was embedded within the highly localized legal order that emerged after the revolution. Within this legal order, the piece was applied to matters involving the public order, not to private property. Each jurisdiction produced inconsistent rulings aimed at restoring the peace rather than producing a uniform, consistent body of law. Social relationships, as much as geography, define the boundaries of these local jurisdictions. The locality could be a handful of close neighbors who gathered at a magistrate's hearing and thus place matter, but it could also be hundreds of people connected loosely through knowledge about a case that was being tried at a district court where place mattered less. Or it could also be a dozen or so members of a tight-knit family scattered over hundreds of miles, but united in their determination to influence a particular legal matter. The most visible of these venues were circuit courts, which met on a regular schedule in county seats or court towns, which held jury trials, and which dealt with a great deal of government business. But circuit courts were only the most conspicuous part of a system dominated by even more localized legal proceedings, which unfolded actually here at both the local levels and throughout the entire system. And I want to emphasize here that this sort of local legalized logic is, is a logic. It's not just a place. It's a way of, of, of conceptualizing the law. That said, this logic was most clearly expressed at the local level, in particular places. Magistrates are one of the best examples. They not only screen cases and tried minor offenses, but also kept tabs in a range of matters involving markets and morals. In most legal matters, the interested parties themselves collected evidence, gathered witnesses, and represented themselves. 
cases were decided by common law in its traditional sense of a flexible collection of principles rooted in local custom, but that also included an array of texts and principles, including stuff generated at the state level, as potential sources for authoritative legal principles. So in localized law, you could quote your mother-in-law and a statute all in one breath and not see any kind of contradiction in doing so. The piece was both definitive and elusive. It constituted a hierarchical order that forced everyone into its patriarchal embrace and raised its collective interests over those of any given individual. Beyond that, however, the content of the piece remained purposefully vague, both because it was governed and constituted by specific personal relationships and accepted practices that varied widely from locality to locality. In fact, the piece meant nothing in the absence of the actual social relationships, of these actual social relationships, a situation that placed people at the center of legal practice and legal principles in a very literal sense. To set the legal process in motion, people had to identify instances of disorder, of which actually there was no shortage in most local communities. And the range of things that people thought were disorderly is truly amazing in my mind. And people used the system then to defend their own interests, but they were just as likely to provide information on wrongs done to others. Complaints, however, only gained traction if it was clear that the incident involved a threat to the public order. It had to transcend the individual. You had to make the case that this was about something more. That standard, however, was more accommodating than we might expect because the peace folded everyone into its jurisdiction. Even those without rights, such as wives, children, slaves, and servants, had direct access to this arena of law. And they also had some influence over it, but only through the relationships that subordinated them within families and communities, not through the recognition of their individual rights. Similarly, white patriarchs exercised domestic authority at the behest of the peace, not in their own right. When their actions disturbed the peace, whether through inadequate or excessive use of authority, they experienced censure. Keeping the peace meant keeping everyone, from the lowest to the highest, in their appropriate places, as actual people, not just as abstractions. The resolution of conflicts and the resulting statements about the law also involved people. Judgments rested on the situated knowledge of observers in local communities, in which an individual's credit, which was also character or reputation, was established through family and neighborhood ties, and it continually assessed through gossip networks. To know a person, you actually had to know that person, and that had to be continually circulated throughout the community. Local officials and juries judged the reliability of testimony based on the individual's credit, as well as on personal prescriptive markers of status, such as gender, race, age, or class. In this system, the words of subordinates could assume considerable legal authority. The effects of legal decisions also remained with particular people involved because the system was so personalized. The result was a legal system composed of inconsistent rulings, which, rather than providing precedent, offered options from which to choose. There was really no uniform law to appeal to. In the operation of the peace, law was constituted, constituted through social relationships. That dynamic, which also recasts the relationship between law and society, poses broader questions about the conceptual location and production of law by extending the field into the lives of ordinary people the workings of local communities, and new regions of the country. Now, this wider perspective, I think, suggests new conceptual frames for making generalizations about legal change. So I want to go over these last three areas in this last part of the talk. Within the logic of the piece, people had a different relationship to the law than is posited in much of the historiography. People, even people without rights, influence localized law in a basic structural sense. These people and the body of knowledge upon which they drew actually constituted the law. The law was not separate from them, they generated it. It is a relationship, I think, that widens the field of legal history, particularly in the early 19th century. I don't think you can do this in the 20th century, but in the early 19th century, I think we need to take note. And we need to take note because it joins question about the law to topics that are usually left to other fields namely social history, cultural history, and related areas such as women's history, African-American history, and labor history. In the post-revolutionary South, for instance, slaves, wives, children, poor people, and free people of color all left a direct imprint on legal principles as well as their application. Yet we do not usually think of these people as central to the production of law in this period. Law regulated them, they did not produce it. That relationship between two people and the law shifts the basis of analysis from the outcomes of cases, 
to the development and the development of legal, legal abstractions, to broader questions about people's access to the system and their place within the practice of law. So we're moving from outcomes to process. Once you move to process, you begin to see actually a different way of evaluating change over time in terms of people's access to the law and the practice, how that changes. The point of law in the state and national jurisdictions generally has been the identification, preservation, and application of legal principles, many of which are framed in terms of the rights of abstract individuals. The workings of the piece, however, suggest that these individual rights provide a poor standard by which to evaluate changes in either law or government in the decades following the revolution. Individuals regularly pursued their own interests in localized law, but to the extent that individuals figured in the process at all, they did so through hierarchical family and community relationships that connected to, to the piece. Individuals are not abstracted, they're realized through their relationship to others. And this system, moreover, did not treat their claims as expression of rights. And to the extent, and, and they also didn't treat them as individuals, as, I'm sorry, I was cutting stuff here, now I'm getting lost here. Um, and so they didn't treat these uh, claims as expression of rights. And so to view the system in terms of individuals or individual rights is actually to misconstrue the dynamics stretching a very modern, contemporary conception of an individual and their legal rights and legal positioning backwards in time and well beyond their reach. Now, in one sense, place and logic are bound up together here. In one sense, the logic of the piece, particularly the centrality of people in the constitution of law, was always about place because peace was actually practiced in local jurisdictions. That connection between the logic of the peace and localized areas is really important. But it's rooted in local areas because it is so dependent on personal relationships. It's not the local area per se, it's the social dynamics in that local area that actually provide the foundations for understanding the logic of the peace. But bringing this local area, these local areas and these social relationships into sharper focus, I think, does change our view of the entire legal terrain in this period. Our entire legal terrain that also includes state and national law. In legal history, the pejorative connotations so often applied to all things local actually reach back to post-revolutionary, the post-revolutionary period. And leaders then who are bent on creating strong state and national governing institutions and uniform bodies of law. These men, most of whom were professionally trained lawyers, not coincidentally, were part of a national network that applied revolutionary ideals to create rationalized bodies of law and centralized institutions of governance. For many, one of the most professing, pressing concerns in this period was the solidification of their state's legal authority. State institutions, as they envisioned them, would produce and maintain a uniform body of law based on the protection of individual rights. To realize that goal, these reformers actually faced two obstacles. The logic of the peace and the authority of local jurisdictions, obstructions so entwined that it, they appeared as a single problem, namely localized law. Now history proved crucial to this whole task. As reformers worked to create these uniform bodies of law, first in property issues and then in public matters, they also compiled documentary sources and constructed narratives that obscured the fact that local jurisdictions actually did have authority over a broad range of public matters. They also dismissed the logic of localized law and the peace, claiming that it represented chaos and not order. And instead, they cast this whole system, localized law with the peace, as an archaic throwback, which inevitably gave way to progressive change as laws were standardized and rights were uniformly defined and applied, and progress and democracy ensued. In the process, reformers generated a set of expectations about where the law resided and how it moved through the system. Not only did reformers separate the state from the local and made logics seem like places, but they also associated the state with a certain kind of legal logic that they subscribed to and insisted on its superiority. Reformers had such confidence in this vision of the legal system that they described it in normative terms. Since there was no other option, the system evolved naturally, if somewhat haltingly and fitfully and not fast enough, in this direction. Um, I thought that was my time. <laughs> Law. Their rhetoric, so powerfully articulated in the archival sources, has led historians themselves to embed this vision within the historiography. 
Now, state leaders' accounts are accurate in the sense that the logic of state law became more elaborate, sophisticated, and influential between 1787 and 1840. They're absolutely right about that. In other respects, though, they were prescriptive rather than descriptive. Even as state law expanded and covered more ground, its relationship to localized law was never as clear-cut as state leaders would have liked. Localized law, with the governing logic of the peace, continued to have considerable influence throughout the antebellum period and long afterward, even at the state level, because it was embedded in the culture in ways that made it very difficult to eliminate. And if anything, the concept of the peace and its logic is very capacious, and it moves back and forth and has no problems kind of transgressing spaces and boundaries that historians like to draw. Neither the legal system nor reformers' narrative of legal history worked as they portrayed it. These dynamics suggest that localities actually provide productive places from which to develop larger generalizations about law and government, particularly in the immediate post-revolutionary decades. It is not so much the places as the legal logic here that is important. In the logic of the localized system, state laws did not necessarily control local practice define the needs of the peace in local areas, or constitute a definitive body of law uniformly applicable throughout the state. You might think so, state leaders might think so, but a lot of people in the United States did not actually think so. And in fact, these laws were just another set of legal principles generated in another place. So the state, because the state was a different place, its laws often do not represent the practices of other places in the United States particularly well. It's one little bitty thing. It's not actually representative. Localities also provide a better basis for generalizations that can account for differences among the nation's various regions and provide them a truly national history, which is a little counterintuitive to say that you can provide a national history by looking at local areas. The focus of my work, for instance, is on the South, a place often deemed either exceptional or backwards and certainly not representative of the national experience. That is because, I think, of the frame of reference. Usually state level laws and institutions are compared to each other. A frame of reference that is problematic because it assumes what did not yet exist, already constituted states that would eventually form distinct regions. Southern historiography with Southern exceptionalism, I think, really complicates and <coughs> exacerbates this problem. Um, and I can comment more on that if you'd like me to. Changing the perspective and bringing local jurisdictions into focus widens the perspective so as to include the South and other areas of the country within narratives of legal history. That contrast, contrasting between localized law and its emphasis on the peace and legal developments at the state level with their emphasis on abstractions and uniformity, rather than comparing states to other states, highlights striking similarities between southern states and states in the rest of the nation. In the early 19th century, southern states developed, actually, centralized government institutions with rationalized bodies of law, just like states elsewhere in the United States. And you see that if you compare those states in the south to localized jurisdictions. Reform-minded southern leaders drew on political principles usually associated with a liberal state in the north, private property, individual rights, and a limited but theoretically democratic government that protected those rights and encouraged individual initiative. In the context of a slave society, those principles resulted in extreme legal inequalities and rigid political exclusions. While these aspects of the South are usually considered unrepresentative of national trends, they parallel developments in the North, where recent historiography has emphasized growing inequality, expressed in categorical terms of race, class, and gender, and linked to the spread of liberal individualism. When the analysis includes localities made visible by recognition of the peace as a legal construct, Southern legal history provides insights into the origins and reconstructions of inequality in the nations as a whole. As the history of the South indicates, the extension of rights to new portions of the population is really only part of the story, and maybe even a not particularly interesting part of the story. The meanings given to individual rights were and are as important as their distribution. Although rights exist as abstractions in law, they are always applied in context. Without political backing and a strong commitment to democracy and equality, a government based on the protection of individual rights can lead in profoundly oppressive directions. In the South, the same principles that we usually associate with individual liberty, democracy, and equality were mobilized in defense of slavery, the nation's most potent symbol of tyranny and repression. We usually treat slavery as an exception that could be explained by its divergence from national principles, 
But the system of vesting some with rights in the labor and body of others was far more pervasive than many Americans would like to recognize, even today. The principles of equal rights were, and still are, extended in democratic directions only by political struggle, which also confounds our notions of the separation of law and society. And now I'm coming on my conclusion here, so I'm, I'm heading towards the finish line. The piece is conceptually useful because it reinforces approaches that already define, I think, the best legal history in the field. It forces us to confront the presence of multiple, even conflicting traditions within the law. Instead of displacing them onto society or debating which is really the authoritative expression of the law, is it really the local level? Is it really the state level? But that's not really the question. More than that, the piece forces us to deal with those complications within legal history. Instead of relegating them outside the bounds of the field, oh, there's a complication that must be society. Go deal with that today. The challenge is to think more critically, I think, about what the law is at any given time and what that means for the way we understand the law in our own historical moment. Who defines the law? Where is it located? What does it do? And that makes a big difference when you're talking about narratives in legal history, where you start tells a lot about where you're going to go, where you start frames the entire narrative. And the framework of the piece suggests that all of those questions are more difficult than they seem. The answers, moreover, lead not to pluralism with its easy affirmation of multiple legal traditions and the resulting obfuscation of power dynamics that elevate some of those traditions over others. Rather, they lead to different historical narratives in which it is possible to tell a national legal history by looking locally and by emphasizing the place ordinary people have had in making law. The results would also connect the field of legal history more directly, more directly and more productively to other historical subfields. In one sense, the field of legal history has become something of an outlier, actually, in the historical profession. And you see this if you go to conferences in the just general you know, US history or general American history or general Southern history. Among, legal historian, among historians outside legal history, the perception is that the scholarship in the field is insular and difficult to penetrate because the central issues of the field have developed in ways that appear disconnected from debates in other fields. Books that are widely known in this field of legal history are not known outside it. Even the designation legal history can make it difficult for a book to find a wider audience because it is presumed to be largely irrelevant to other kinds of fields. In another sense, however, legal history maintains a high profile in the historical profession. Historians of all varieties rely heavily on legal sources and incorporate analyses of law into their scholarship. Often, however, these historians do such work without ever engaging legal historians or ever even actually figuring out how to talk about legal institutions in a way that would make sense to legal historians. That juxtaposition between the marginalization of the field and the centrality of the topic provides both a caution and a challenge. We need new frameworks to widen the scope of the field, lest we lose control over it. Thank you. Paper, so you had a chance to look at it. I thought I'd uh, say a few remarks uh, uh, that occurred to me in the course of uh, Laura's presentation, other presentations today, uh, and then relate them to the paper, um, which uh, you know, I'd love to hear what you thought about the paper too. But, but try to make it more of a conversation as we move toward the um, toward the end of the, uh, of the session. So it was about a year ago, was it, Chris, that, that you called? And um, when Chris called about a year ago, it, uh, he found me in a really weak uh, position. I was in the, then the second year of a project that I'm still engaged in, in writing a history of uh, the laws of war, which is to say the international body of international law that purports to regulate the conduct of armed conflict. Um, I was in the second year, and I, I felt completely and hopelessly swamped by primary materials, by, by brute facts that I had no idea how to sort into a discourse or a framework of analysis. Uh, or, or any such thing. There are something like 100,000 court martial and military commission records in the National Archives uh, from the Civil War alone, and I was just completely swimming in them. There are fascinating paper collections and archives full of letters that have never been sorted for this category, that is to say, for the laws of war as a category, which somehow evade the attention of historians of military history or historians of foreign relations. Um, uh, and so I, I was completely at sea in this uh, 
this ocean of, of primary materials. And Chris called and said, let's rise above the, the mess, let's rise above the fray and think more abstract. And so I leapt at the opportunity to do this. Uh, um, uh, and and, uh, and was glad was glad to accept. Uh, another reason that I, I left to the to the uh, opportunity to, to talk about the theory of how to do legal history was I think I shared Chris's vague sense of of, of dissatisfaction or at least stalemate with the existing uh, theoretical framework um, uh, in in the field. Um, uh, some combination of uh, society shapes law, law shapes society, a kind of mutual cons uh, constitutivity uh, combined with its cousin, which uh, Morty talked about earlier today and John Kalmaroff yesterday, the law as site of contestation, when these two things I think are closely uh, related, seemed to be the place where the theory of the field had come to rest, and there didn't seem to be much, uh, much movement uh, off of those uh, resting spots or any real uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to develop new uh, theoretical new theoretical approaches. And so this is another reason that I left to, uh, to Chris's invitation to think more broadly, more generally, about um, uh, theoretical moves that might be made at this state of the, um, of, of the, uh, of, of the literature. Um, as I thought more and more about the invitation that Chris had, uh, had made to us, uh, I started to change my view, though. And it may be that the sea of materials that I found myself hopelessly lost in in the walls of war started to come into some kind of uh, uh, blurry uh, uh, view for me. But, but I think it's also as I as I reflected more on the, the state of the, the the theoretical state of the field, uh, the more sanguine I became about it. Actually, and the more I thought, uh, largely thanks to people in this room, that it was actually cause for celebration, not dismay. The state of the um, and I thought I'd say a few a few words uh, uh, about that. It seems to me that the the, um, the state of the character, the state of the field as it exists right now, has sponsored a huge and growing number of really interesting studies. Um, uh, there are legal historians working in all sorts of different places uh, around the country and around the world. Many of them papers we've heard uh, here. Uh, most of them, maybe even all of them, sponsored loosely by the theoretical agendas and frameworks that. Um, uh, uh, People in this room and elsewhere uh, working in the field have constructed over the last over the last several decades, um, and so I thought what I what I propose here is something that cuts a little bit at the um, uh, against the grain of some of the conversations we've been having for the last two days. But it would be a kind of um, provisional, uh, purposive, naive empiricism. That is, what we need now is not theory about the field. We need to know things about how the law has worked in the past. We need to know about these brute facts that I was swimming around um, uh, uh, a year ago when, um, when Chris called. And I, I call it a provisional naive empiricism, because I don't mean to be a naive empiricist in some Neanderthal-like way, but provisional for the purposes of, of working out uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the edges of the field that has been opened up by the existing, and I think, as I've heard over the last uh, day or two, still relatively unchallenged idea of law and society as mutually constitutive, and that law as site of contestation for the kinds of, um, of conflicts that, that, uh, um, that, that, come into, um, that come into its, its domain. Um, so, so is there a crisis in legal, the, the theory of legal history? When Chris called, I was convinced that there was. The more I thought about it, I'm, I'm not sure that there is. I think the success of many of the papers we've seen in the last couple of days might be testimony to, uh, to, that, to that fact. If there is a, um, a, a crisis is too strong a word, but if there is a difficulty in the field, I might call it, and this is going to sound very primitive, but an in industrial organization problem for the field, rather than a, 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 a meta problem or a theory problem for the field. So now that the theoretical frameworks, or now that there are theoretical frameworks in which to work quite happily, and in which to learn, uh, uh, produce new knowledge about the uh, history of, of the law, uh, it seems to me that the, the, the industrial structure of the field in which work isn't perfectly suited to the production of new, of new studies. So law schools are not well organized um, to, to send out students to do multi-year research projects on some uh, uh, significant but, but relatively minor in the grand scheme of things part of the history of the law. It's not, uh, it's not something that law students have the time to do, nor is it something to, to take, for example, a, uh, plea bargaining, or tort settlements, or all these things that happen in the deep recesses of the law that you know, Barbara's able to, uh, to bring out for us in part, but that still remain deeply mysterious and great to know more about. Law students can't go out, they don't have time, and there are very few law professor jobs awaiting the person who's counted the tort settlements in 
uh, California for a particular 10 year period, absent some big intervention. So there's an industrial organization problem on the law school side for filling in the theoretical framework that we have. But on the history department side, I think that Laura said really uh, uh, quite, uh, quite usefully, uh, pointed out quite usefully the uh, ways in which history departments still have a complicated relationship to the technical sounding uh, material that comes out of the legal historical field. So the theory, it seems to me, looks good. It's the industrial organization of the, 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 um, of the field that, that uh, has, has held back uh, the production of new knowledge within these disciplinary frameworks, but I, I don't want to be too um, uh, pessimistic uh, about the um, uh, about this industrial organization uh, problem. It seems to me that if anything, there's an extraordinary abundance of new work that's coming out, and um, uh, we should be grateful to the creators of the theoretical paradigms of the of the, of the last generation um, uh, for for having for having done so. So the the problem, in other words, is is how much we don't know about the past of the law. Um, uh, as much as it is how to think about what we do know about the past of the law. And so this is one of the reasons that I'm studying uh, in this project the history of the laws of war, a sub subset of um, the field of the history of international law. It seems to me it's one of the areas, and there are many of them, uh, which goes uh, largely unknown and um, uh, largely uh, uh, unstudied in, um, uh, in our field of, of, of legal history. So I thought I'd say, uh, now uh, attaching these uh, these comments to the paper, a few things about what it is we don't know about the histories of the laws of war uh, in hopes of, um, uh, of uh, well, in hopes in large part of getting uh, comments from you about uh, ways we might, we might start to, um, to think about them. Um, so, so part of the problem in the history of the laws of war in, in American history uh, is that there are two narratives, two meta-narratives, two grand stories uh, available uh, in the culture generally, sometimes among historians, sometimes uh, among uh, experts in the laws of war or, uh, or, or journalists uh, and, and, uh, and uh, sophisticated uh, observers, two stories. One is what I like to think of as the declension thesis. And um, this story, once upon a time, uh, the United States of America understood the value of the laws of nations, obeyed the laws of nations, paid fealty to the laws of nations, but somewhere along the line, and there are a variety of dates at which uh, different variations on the declension thesis put it, but at some point along the line, uh, fell away from the um, uh, attachment to, uh, to international law and the laws of war in particular that was characteristic of an earlier generation of American, of American statesmen. That's the declension uh, uh, narrative. The alternative narrative is the, is the novelty narrative. Uh, and this is a narrative you can see especially in uh, uh, experts on, uh, on military law, uh, on the laws of war, especially from inside the military, people who are astounded by the relatively recent increase in the salience of law, legality, and the legal profession inside the military. So targeting decisions in which there are lawyers standing behind the shoulders of the, um, of the commander making the targeting uh, decision. Or uh, for any of you who saw the, um, the really uh, riveting and horrifying video the New York Times and other sources linked just last week, on a helicopter over Baghdad from 2007, in which two Reuters reporters were killed. The, uh, the stunning, one of the stunning features, there were a number, uh, one of the stunning features of, of, the, um, of the events in 2007 uh, that the video portrayed was the rule-bound character of the extraordinarily destructive violence that you were watching. Um, the, uh, the helicopter pilots who decided whether or not to fire are completely guided uh, by a set of rules of engagement that they have, which they appear to follow scrupulously uh, notwithstanding that it's, able, it's, it's uh, capable of producing and does produce uh, really dismaying um, uh, uh, collateral, collateral damage. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so, so two theories then, the declension uh, thesis and the novelty thesis. Now you'll notice that these two theories, um, uh, each on, on, on it, would, would, it wouldn't be so bad if, um, uh, if the, if the uh, uh, the field had a wrong theory, because you'll notice that one of these two theories really has to be wrong. They can't both be right. They're actually uh, at odds with one another. Um, but I think the, the really acute problem is that neither of these stories is plausible. Um, the declension thesis uh, has, has very little to say about the extraordinary controversies and contestations that existed with, inside the field of the laws of war, going back to the founding and before. Uh, the novelty thesis has no account of the long history of dealings and engagements between American statesmen, soldiers, uh, lawyers, uh, judges on the one hand, uh, and, and the laws of war on, on the other. So neither of these two stories seem to me to be especially good frameworks for um, for making sense of the, um, 
uh, of, of the laws of war. And in large part, I think it's because of the, uh, the, the huge body of, of, um, of material that simply goes uncomprehended, goes unknown, and that we need to know about in order to write a better version of the history of this uh, subset, this part of the um, of, of, of our, uh, our, legal, our legal history. Uh, so, so examples of things we, we don't know. Um, uh, there's an extraordinary moment in the early republic in which uh, American statesmen, lawyers, judges, uh, begin to uh, articulate what looks like a 20th or 21st century international humanitarian lawyer rule about private property. The rule is uh, 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 articulated in, uh, in the midst of the revolution. It's articulated again in the War of 1812. And the idea, and it comes out of uh, most strongly in uh, some of the work of uh, Ben Franklin on, on, the, on the topic, and the idea that private property should be immune from attack during um, during the war. Now, what, what we don't know about this is where this came from, where this came from. There's almost no precedent for it in the European literature that the uh, that American statesmen and lawyers jurists purport to be drawing on. Uh, the 18th century Enlightenment jurists, uh, people like uh, uh, Vattel and others uh, on, on the European continent, will say things like, of course, you can attack private property in war so long as it's enemy private property. Um, and that's, that'll be section one. Section two is, you really should try not to. I mean, best, best, to, uh, a war among civilized states is much better if we leave this uh, sort of stuff alone. The U.S. alternative uh, simply drops uh, Section 1 uh, and makes the, the gentle suggestion of, uh, of, of Vattel Section 2 into the, the rule. So, so what don't we know about, um, about this? We have no idea where this came from. There's no literature. There's not even in the literature on legal history the observation of this novel departure. Uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, American legal practice, let alone the beginnings of an explanation for why we might see it. Um, uh, um, so one of the things I'm trying to do is sort out why it is uh, that we'd see this novel departure in the American characterization of the rule about private property. And it occurs to me, and this goes to my, my, um, my, my comments earlier about my, uh, uh, my sense that the, the frameworks, the analytic frameworks that we have are actually relatively useful. My sense is the only way I'll be able to answer this question is by reference to precisely the kinds of analytic frameworks that we have at hand already, thanks to uh, people uh, people in this room. So the question will be about uh, whether or not the uh, American proposed content of the rule about private property or booty in wartime is explained by reference to some set of interests that are exogenous to the law, some, some space outside of law in which interests uh, drive Americans to adopt a uh, relatively protective private property rule for fear that British armies will start taking American private property, which is, after all, relatively vulnerable given the tiny size of the American, of the American military. Um, or we might tell a different kind of story, a constitutive story in which uh, the, the American proposed rule is a kind of vindication of a sense of identity that American, that early American statesmen, lawyers, and jurists have formed around the gentlest versions, the most civilized versions of the European law of nations tradition uh, at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. So that would be a familiar, a familiar moment for legal historians, choosing between, on the one hand, a, a, an account of the of a, a um, an account of a legal rule that's drawn constitutively from the legal regime itself or uh, from outside. And no doubt the answer is going to involve some kind of a combination of the two. We'll be back to the stalemate, the theoretical stalemate that Chris started us off with. Uh, but I'm not sure that's such a bad place to be. Figuring out the precise uh, uh, combination of the two um, of the two uh, influences in, in this situation, as in so many other situations, is exactly the fun and the interesting work of, of legal history. More stuff we, um, we don't know about in, uh, uh, in the field of the, um, of the laws of war. Uh, to the extent that there is a, a body of literature on the history of international law, uh, and there is something of a literature, it's almost exclusively organized around the, uh, the elite practitioners, the, um, uh, the treatise writers, the judges, uh, and usually it's justices on the US Supreme Court, the John Marshalls, the Joseph Stories, Henry Wheaton, James Kent, the people who articulate uh, ostensibly coherent and, and well, ostensibly well-formed uh, views on the character of the field that goes under the name international, international law. And so we have a set of doctrinal histories that purport to deal with the theoretical and doctrinal moves made at this level of abstraction. The, uh, the reason that I, I chose, I was looking for a topic in, in the history of international law in particular, and the reason I chose the laws of, of war as a way to go about this is precisely because it offers the opportunity to write about, think about uh, the legal history of a body of international law outside of the mandarins of the field, the treatise writers and, and the jurists. Um, so we know almost nothing 
about the loss of war in the hands of Andrew Jackson and his militia. And of course, if you want to know about the history of the loss of war, if you leave out Andrew Jackson and his militia, well, you've really cooked the books. I mean, you've essentially decided the history of the laws will, will, be, uh, will be represented by the treatise writers um, uh, and the um, uh, and the manners. And it's, it's now old hat in this room that, that we can't write legal history around, around the elite jurists and their treatises without um, uh, including uh, a much wider array of, 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 of groups, people who come into contact with, engage with, have agency over, uh, and interactions with um, the, the law. So, so we know almost nothing about the way in which um, uh, more popular interactions with uh, the, um, the laws of war tradition uh, went about. And I'll tell you a little bit just about how I've come to, uh, to, to think about that right now. My, my first thought was that what we had a story of in the early republic was a story of a clash of cultures. There was a culture organizing itself professionally around the, uh, the, the, uh, the materials, the ideas, uh, the doctrines of international law and the law of nations. That would be the marshals, the stories, the Wheatons, the Kents, the elites mostly on the East Coast, uh, sometimes organized around the prize court, uh, the prize case practice at the U.S. Supreme Court, where a group of specialized professional lawyers emerges in the first couple decades of the um, of the 19th century. Who's sent one of their central job is to argue law of war at sea kinds of um, kind of cases. So I thought we'd have a culture clash between this professional group on the one hand and a group of contemptuous populists on the other who wanted to hold the tradition at. at at arm's length with Jackson at their, at their lead. But I, I think actually upon a, a closer investigation, the story is really quite different. That Jackson and, and um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Tennessee militia that marches into Florida, for example, in, uh, uh, in 1818, are in large part mobilized by exactly the rules, which they sometimes express some contempt for. But it's the violation of the laws of war that in part provides much of the energy that they bring to conflict, and much of the uh, much of the passion that results in so much ostensibly lawless destruction. Why is it? How, how does that? How does the logic work? Um, it, it's precisely the violations of the rules which sets off the passions of an American uh, Jacksonian militia. So this is uh, especially evident in, uh, in wars with American Indians and armed conflict with American Indians, but it's also uh, true in. Um, uh, in, in the huge popular mobilization in the revolutionary period, and again in the War of 1812, around the idea of British atrocities, oftentimes uh, in um, uh, arm in arm with, with uh, Indian allies of, of the British. So I think we, we, we have a more uh, sophisticated view uh, than my initial uh, culture clash view would suggest. We'll see actually the laws of war run through wide groups uh, in, in early American, uh, in early American uh, legal history, and, and we'll actually see lots of dialogue from uh, from the top and from the bottom. Now, uh, as, as referring back to my earlier comments, you'll notice again, there's nothing theoretically uh, novel about this move. This move is actually quite, sits quite comfortably uh, in the theoretical apparatus of the last several decades. <coughs> um, uh, it's just that we didn't know anything. We still know far too little. I still know far too little about the content, the now naive empiricist, now in my naive empiricist mode, the content of the, of the rules and the conduct around those rules, they simply remain uh, unknown to the literature uh, that, that we have. So um, uh, I, I, could, I could go on and list more examples of, um, of kinds of things we don't know. You'll see a number of them uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the paper, and I'm happy to talk at more length about any of them. I thought I'd, I'd end with uh, one, one observation, um, which, which is, the, uh, as I think about the, the organizational structure, the industrial organization uh, of, of the field. One of the most striking features to me in the last couple years is the increased salience in history departments of histories of international law. Uh, all of a sudden, there are a number of history departments that are, are hiring people who do the history of international law. There have been uh, projects, books, uh, articles that are pouring out about the history of international law. And uh, one, one uh, uh, surmise that I have is more by, by in the way of a prediction or, or a guess about the future is that we may see um, uh, theoretical uh, advances, theoretical moves in the future may come out of exactly for, out of out of this field, out of the history of international law, because it raises a huge number of issues that don't really come up in the um, uh, uh, in the, the traditional vineyards in which legal historians have been working. So things like the legal construction of the state as a as a as a as an entity, as a as a force in. Um, uh, in legal history, which come out really nicely in the history of international law, and are a little more recessive in um, 
in other sorts of fields. So the, um, uh, the, the, the plea I've made here for you is a, a plea for provisional, purposive, naive empiricism uh, in fields about which we know far too little because there remain fields in which uh, the production of the knowledge of brute facts that go, go still unknown uh, uh, to this day, notwithstanding the, uh, the huge proliferation of wonderful literature. So a provisional, purposive, naive empiricism, and especially a provisional, purposive, naive empiricism about international law, which we just know far too little about. So thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I saw uh, I, I saw my Cornell West speak uh, for the first time uh, two weeks ago. And I realized one of the things he does, he's a brilliant speaker, and the main, the main thing he does it so well is he's brilliant, but, but one thing he does quite nicely is he actually he starts very quietly, and then everyone has to lean in, you know, and, and kind of pay attention because he's speaking very quietly, and then he starts to you know, rouse and boom. Um, so things to learn, you know, as you pay attention. All right, my paper uh, is about, uh, uh, the, is interested in the form and development uh, of American empire. Um, empire has been defined broadly and narrowly. Uh, it involves hard power, soft power. Um, though some see it as an economic global network, uh, most, most people who write about empire retain some notion of a nation state, an imperial nation state, uh, that dominates terrain outside of its sovereign <laughs> borders uh, through a combination of military violence or some combination of military violence political sovereignty, economic power, uh, and cultural hegemony. Uh, popular conversations about American empire have tended to begin, uh, this is the most recent era, with, the, with George Bush II, uh, perhaps George Bush I, uh, perhaps even going back uh, to our Cold War. Uh, but in this conversation, it is the notion of the US, of US empire as a military power, as a, a nation engaged in, in, in battles on foreign land, uh, a nation imposing democracy, uh, putting those two words together purposely uh, on, on other nations who are attempting to do so. Uh, as such, we tend to think of the beginnings of American empire with war and with offshore engagement. Um, we tend to think of, the, of, in our nation's history, the turn of the 20th century, at the end of the 19th century, uh, with, the, with wars in the Philippines, uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, and so forth. That's usually the beginning period of American empire. Um, when we think of court cases, we think, too, the insular cases of this time period around the Philippines. So, um, so but his recent work has, has well pointed out, uh, particularly in history, uh, and somewhat in legal history, uh, the ideas and certainly the aspirations of empire uh, in the United States uh, begin much further back. 
Um, I begin uh, my paper with uh, uh, a few quotes as examples. Um, Alexander Hamilton in Federalist One, uh, the first Federalist paper, refers to the fate of an empire, uh, the United States as an empire, in many respects the most interesting in the world. Thomas Jefferson, no constitution was ever uh, before so well calculated as ours for extensive empire. Um, Daniel Boone, uh, to show that this was not just uh, an elite uh, level, I don't know if he counts as an elite or a cultural figure, um, where, where wretched wigwams stood, the miserable abodes of savages, we beheld the foundations of cities laid that in all probability will rival the greatest upon earth. Right, so the aspirations are clearly there. Um, and as, as Daniel Holzbosch uh, has aptly noted, uh, that when the founders uh, uh, first wrote the Constitution and thought about uh, America and American empire, they looked at empire both backwards and forward. We came from empire, uh, we thought of ourselves as becoming an empire. Uh, we were also surrounded by empires. We were surrounded, uh, we, we came from the British, we were surrounded by the French uh, as well as the Spanish. Uh, we were also surrounded by uh, a notable number of Native American empires, although I'm not sure we thought of that as being surrounded in quite the same way. But certainly, uh, empire was ever present uh, in, our, in our understandings and conversations uh, about the United States. So this paper um, is, is an examination of this first period of, of American empire, the taking of the U.S. continent before we go overseas. I do hope, actually, in my, uh, as, as I expand this paper, uh, there are other aspects of American empire, even in this early period. Liberia uh, uh, is one. The West Indies, uh, Latin America, um, slave trade. Right? These were all uh, important elements of where the United States was involved, maybe it was with, with some notion uh, of empire. Um, in this period, in terms of the U.S. continent, uh, this is a time of massive expansion. We began uh, with the 13 states, um, which uh, weren't even as the size they are today, uh, and moved very quickly uh, by really 1850 uh, to the whole continental United States. This occurred in two processes. One was acquiring the land, um, and this was fairly easy, as we know. Uh, it was largely treaties with, uh, with European empires. Um, it was, uh, you know, as with the, we know with Napoleon and the Louisiana Purchase, a, a quite uh, uncontroversial, un I mean, depending on the on which, Bless you. Uh, um, a fairly uh, controversial process. The second was more complicated, and that is, of course, possessing the land. Uh, much of this land, which we we uh, we claimed and we we argued that we had that we had uh, uh, some uh, some assertion over, uh, we did not possess. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, that becomes really the, the interesting part of the question. And my question uh, specifically is understanding government, uh, both government authority and government capacity to take possession of this land. This need to be the question um, of this period uh, by asking about government, uh, the role of the government in terms of taking this land. It need to be the question. One could argue that American expansion uh, during this time period was not about the government at all, that it was about settler ambition, about settler violence, um, about a government that was too weak to stop it. Um, this is actually a fairly uh, common refrain in, in um, much work of history, especially uh, 20, 30 years ago, but even more recent work uh, such as Patrick Griffin, uh, uh, Robert Cohen, um, further back with Michael Rogan, Francis Prusa, who said that the government was trying to stop the settlers, and really the government was too weak to stop it. Had the government been stronger, we might not have had the, the expansion, uh, the, the rapid expansion of the same kind. Uh, now Ferguson, uh, who's recently written about American empire, uh, skirts over this period as in two or three pages, saying this was easy. This was an early process, uh, disease, weak opposition. This, there isn't really much role for government here in terms of, of acquiring and possessing the land. Fareed Zakaria, um, in his first book, uh, while still a, a political scientist and not a, a, a pundit on, a, on a, The Daily Show, um, and other places, of course, um, um, argued that American empire begins with the 1890s because in this early period, uh, prior to the Civil War, the, the U.S. government lacked capacity, it lacked the ability to have empire, even if it was an aspiration, it was unable to actually uh, partake in this role. I think all these approaches are, are misleading uh, in, in important ways. Uh, first, it wasn't entirely easy, um, as Ferguson suggests. Uh, by counts of the U.S. government alone, and, the, and these counts are controversial, but by counts of the U.S. government in 1800, uh, there were more than 600,000 um, indigenous uh, people within U.S. set borders at the time, uh, which is in contrast to 4.4 million American citizens, uh, 900,000 slaves. Uh, that gives you a sense, if we do the math, um, and we're more alert, it would be about, what, one-seventh <laughs> so of the population, a, a sizable population. This is not a simply easy, easy to move uh, population. Uh, we find a number of wars um, 
uh, with indigenous populations. Some of them not very successful, some of them incredibly expensive. The Seminole War, the most expensive war uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, second, even if we think of the government as weak, um, the government is certainly not irrelevant. Uh, Stephen Skoranek, a political scientist, um, has importantly corrected uh, uh, the notion of Tocqueville and Marx and Hegel, who looked to the United States and didn't see a state uh, because their view of the state was, was downtown Berlin or downtown Paris and the big bureaucracies and the buildings uh, that stood there. Uh, and there was a sense that the United States did not have this. Skorana corrects this by saying that even a weak state, uh, or what he calls a patchwork state, uh, a state of courting parties, uh, can be influential in societal development. At the same time, Skoranek's intervention about a state, uh, quote unquote, um, however, has been, has, in, in important ways, prohibited the way we think about, we think about states and power. Um, after all, the notion of the state, the idea of a state, is about power. Um, and in contrast to Tocqueville or, or, or Robert Dahl, uh, the idea of a state is that the government is not simply an expression of society. In contrast to Marx, it is not simply an expression of a dominant class. States. Is if we think of them as states, are thought to be an independent entity with meaningfully independent interests. Uh, we might think of this as institutional dynamics that would lead some of us here to talk about discourse, that would lead uh, political scientists to talk about incentives. Um, for Stephen Skoranek, um, his notion of the state was the development of, of a very Weberian, uh, a Weberian state, uh, the Weberian bureaucrat, the capital city with rows of state buildings um, that housed uh, regulatory apparatuses that are able to impose their will uh, on society. Um, given this, this construct that Skoranek has created, a number of scholars, uh, both uh, within politics and law and, and in history, uh, have attempted to, to challenge him. Skoranek argued we had a weak state, and recently we've had a number of scholars, uh, most notably probably for this crowd, people like uh, William Novak and Brian Ballow, um, who have tried to show that the state was actually more powerful during this time period, whether it's the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Post Office, constitutional authority through court activism, state and local regulatory apparatuses. Um, all of this work is engaged with the, with the creation, uh, a sense that the state was more powerful. And of course, Novak, Ballow, Skoranek, and others are all engaged with the bigger question of how does the state promote a national welfare system? Right? Going back to Tocqueville or, or into the 20th century, uh, thinking of someone like Lou Hartz, um, the question is why no socialism in America? Why has America held, been further behind other, other parts of the world in creating a real regulatory state? Barack Obama sometimes asks this question himself. Uh, at least late at night. Right. Um, in some ways, I argue that this is this is limiting in terms of thinking of how we understand how we understand how we understand states and how states can can act. Um, state power can exist in ways that is less visible. Um, an empire is a nice way to find to illuminate some of these ways in which we see state power um, that is not confined by by the uh, Weberian, Hegelian, Skoranek form of bureaucracy uh, and, and, and bureaucratic state building. Um, for instance, there's now a recent uh, literature on empires, a comparative literature, uh, that is showing that, that successful empires, uh, as an example, Karen Barkey in her work on the Ottoman Empire, uh, that success, successful empires are much less rigid. They're actually flexible. They're able to adapt uh, to new situations. They're able to be, they are dispersed and yet are able to retain power. They are like trees that can bend but won't break, uh, as opposed to notions of, of strong states that are strong but cannot, cannot reach out to these peripheries. Uh, in such such similar ways, so these are uh, some of the ideas that inspired this, and I'm, I focus on three components of this government activism uh, in in American state uh, state and empire building during these early years. Um, the idea, I think, is that this is also will inspire our understanding of today. I hope that as we talk about some of these these pieces of American empire building in the early period, we'll, it'll resonate somewhat with what we think about today, we, whether it's Iraq or whether U.S. more broadly uh, in the world. Um, I'll leave uh, law, uh, the question of law, as uh, third, third and final. So I'll, just, I'll make uh, some, some brief comments on the first two and then, and then throw out some ideas about law as well. Um, so the first is the idea of state as public, uh, a public-private fusion. Um, private, uh, certainly private power, um, uh, for private power to be state-related, it needs to be directed in some way by the state. If private power dominates, then the, then the notion of state disappears. Right? We always have known that private power is important in America. In fact, the arguments of American exceptionalism is that private power is so important, so powerful, that the state is not able to rein it in. So in talking about a public-private fusion, um, the idea is that the state remains important in retaining and restraining uh, private power, and it also benefits from this private power. It can use private power uh, for its own, own purposes. 
Um, we see as a, an example this in the 20th century, uh, the government's reliance on private lawyers uh, to handle much of its, its, its post-1960 uh, statutory uh, developments. Uh, the most dramatic example, of course, is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which lacked enforcement powers uh, and provided uh, private lawyers a lot of its enforcement role. Right? Here is a state-coordinated role enabling private players to partake, the state uh, nonetheless have an authority. I should say here that this is not the same as entirely public control. Right? Once you provide private authority, any form of authority, that you lose a, a public dimension. Right? You may have, have some control over them, but certainly private forces can take things on a, a life of their own uh, in certain ways that, are, that can be unsettling. Um, so uh, the example I want to give for the 19th century um, is the notion of uh, residence and defense, uh, the use of the government here in directing settler expansion uh, and arming the territories. Um, when we think of the 19th century and the expansion of, of the state in this time period, we would think typically of two things. One is settler expansion. The other is using the military and, 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 and winning wars and taking land. Um, I would argue that the state is, is much more subtle in, it, in its role here. Um, land policy is used here to populate and arm the territories, but it's done so in a way both where we use settlers, the U.S. government uses settlers, uh, and it uses settlers to defend the land. So we don't see much in the way of military operations, at least as classically defined, and we also don't see settlers out of control. We see, again, this, this term that was used at the time, residence and defense, um, which is using, using land to, to build barriers between the United States uh, and the indigenous populations. Uh, so very early on, uh, the United States started using uh, military bounties as one example of this, um, as, as a way to bring people into the military in a nation without much, uh, uh, in terms of resources, uh, the U.S. relied extensively on providing bounties uh, to military uh, people who participate in the military uh, and, and reward for service. Now what's interesting about this um, are, are a few things. Well, first, before I say the three things, is millions of acres are given out, millions of acres of land are given out uh, these military bounties and in other forms. Three interesting things about this. First, where? Where is this land that they give out? Um, the land tends to be consistently on the frontier, on the borderlands, directly uh, attached to uh, indigenous populations, where indigenous populations are biggest, where indigenous populations are often most combative. Right? So the land is put, this is strategic, where the land is provided. We have a vast space of land to provide. It's strategic in how it is provided. Second, how much land? Uh, the land is, is small amounts. We push and we centralize people into small spaces. And by doing so, we populate these small areas. We overwhelm these areas with large populations. We push lots of people into small areas. Um, an example of this is actually, uh, actually later than uh, the time period I cover, but the Homestead Acts um, operated this way. They continually provided a very small amount of land, and people rushed to the land. Uh, the notion of the Oklahoma Sooner, for example, uh, which is the name of the football team. The idea of a Sooner was, as soon as the land was released, you had to run to it, to grab it, because everybody was trying to get this land at once. Right? What this does, of course, this is a swarming effect. And again, the land is located strategically, uh, where you have indigenous populations either interspersed or located next to it. It, it enables the United States to direct its populations uh, to, to a, a confrontational point. Right, so that's, that's the second, is a small amount of land and pushing people to these spots. Third, who? Um, and this is, of course, militarized populations. Military bounties um, provide not just the opportunities to give land to, to former veterans, it also puts people uh, with military experience in these lands. Right? It puts them on other places. In other places, without using military bounties, uh, the government passed laws, uh, such as the Armed Occupation Act of 1842, um, which said um, that uh, one had, uh, would be given 160 acres of free land if A, they settled the land for seven years, and B, they owned a gun. <coughs> Defend the land yourself. Right? Um, so this process, and, and the uh, Armed Occupation Act, uh, this followed the Second Cherokee War, um, sorry, Seminole War, uh, uh, in which we had struggled and lost, and in the language, uh, it's in the paper if you'd like to read it, um, the language of congressional testimony is all about, you know, we have failed to win this war, this is a cheap way to, again, uh, using the term, residence defense. Give land out, let these people defend themselves, pack these people together, so again, that they can defend themselves uh, quite, quite, quite nicely. Right? So that's, that's one example of this first idea, the state is, using private forces, using settlers uh, to promote public, public goods. 
All right, so I'll leave that. That's, that's one. The second issue uh, is, is the role of race in this process. And race is, is very interesting in, in state building and empire building. Of course, race is, 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 uh, is inseparable from empire. Right? Empire is, is essentially about race and about othering and about creating difference. Um, race, in this case, is interesting in that it's both an energizer and an inhibitor of empire. Um, it is, of course, an energizer, as Du Bois uh, has famously written uh, in his book, John Brown, um, fusing of, of slavery, fusing of conquest. Um, these provided the energy, the aspirations, uh, the ability to move quickly through, through terrains of populations with little fear of what these populations constituted. Right? So it energized populations. It led, of course, also the emotion and anger, uh, the, the racism that came from this, uh, also helped you know, further energize and, and, and fuse these opportunities. Um, it's intertwined as well, and slave, uh, slave expansion during this time uh, necessitated the leave for more land. Right? There were constant pushing among slave owners uh, and slave act, uh, uh, people who protected slavery uh, to quickly push through these lands. It's not accidental, for instance, that Georgia and many of the southern states where a lot of the confrontations uh, with indigenous populations took place uh, were areas surrounded by slave lands. Right? There was a looking, moving towards these new territories. So again, an energizing factor here is the role of, of slavery uh, as it intertwines um, with, with, um, uh, with, with empire expansion. At the same time, empire is slowed down in interesting ways uh, by, this, uh, by the role of race and, by, and, 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 and uh, the way in which we saw the people we were confronting. Um, we struggled continually with incorporation of new groups. Native Americans, uh, indigenous populations, were seen differently um, uh, than, than uh, African Americans. You know, most famously, you could say infamously, in Dred Scott, right, where Native Americans are seen as a different population uh, than African slaves. African slaves cannot be, or never have been, cannot be American citizens. Native Americans, there is the possibility, it is thrown out there. And actually, throughout this time period, there are conversations, it's unclear, uh, I'm going to need to do more research as to how strong these conversations are, but certainly conversations in the congressional record, in the archives, about creating states, uh, individual states, under the Northwest Ordinance for indigenous populations. Uh, Delaware was thought to be initially for the Delawares. Um, uh, in area around Indiana was also supposed to be a state. So there were conversations of this, we did not do so. The limiting part of this is that as we confronted populations, first on the continent and then as we go abroad, um, we struggle with what we want to do, right? Hawaii, we hold back on taking Hawaii for many, many decades because we don't want a state that would be a non-majority white state. Um, Puerto Rico, right, to this day still controversially understood and, and, and uncompletely understood uh, because of our difficulty in dealing with, with racial questions. Um, so, whereas we contrast with some empires where it was fairly seamless that they reached out and grabbed these areas of land and used them, uh, we struggled much more with that. Right? It was far, far more easy to move people out of our land um, as it was than actually create an empire in the form of the British, the French, uh, the German, uh, the Russian, and so forth. Right. So, so you know, this is still, still obviously a uh, work in progress, but I think there's, there's really interesting questions here going in both directions uh, about ex the expansiveness and the, the restrictions of which race played. All right, third in my remaining minutes, let me talk about law and law as. Um, and I don't really know what to say, law as. Uh, law as legitimizer, I think this is a great one. Uh, law as politics certainly is, is typical in this regard. And when most people think of, of the role of law in this time period, they, the first cases that come to mind are the Johnson v. McIntosh, uh, the various Cherokee cases um, in which the Supreme Court, uh, both alternatively in, in McIntosh, uh, declared that there was a discovery doctrine and that Native Americans uh, did not uh, have, a, have a possession that was equal of the land uh, as, as America, because the US had discovered this land. Uh, on the flip side, uh, the, uh, the Cherokee cases, where the court stands up for uh, the Cherokee population in, in some form, uh, and is ignored by, by Andrew Jackson, uh, in the final uh, trail of tears. Um, I think in many ways, this, this aspect of law, law as part of, of political pronouncements, is less interesting. And this is the kind of material that I would assume you would nod, because I've been nodding throughout my, uh, my two days here at a lot of what I've been hearing, which is you know, uh, not just that law is a place of contestation, but the law uh, certainly structures uh, the, the potential, the understandings, uh, the, the procedural aspects uh, in which uh, taking of land, in which power uh, occurs. Um, and so just a, a few words to mention on that. Um, and a lot of this actually I thought, uh, I don't know how familiar this is outside of political science, but political science are these uh, power debates. Um, 
uh, maybe a Stephen Luke's, I don't know if that's a familiar, disciplines don't cross that well necessarily. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Just the explanation. Sorry? Just the explanation. The explanation. Well, the, the sense of it is that the second phase, the first phase of power is the idea, is basically John's v. McFashion, Cherokee case. We have a confrontation. We see politics at work. The second phase is much more subtle. It's procedural. It's agenda setting. It is um, legitimizing, demobilizing through institutional dynamics. And I think that's where the courts are more interesting here. Um, and so just a few examples. One is courts incentivize. Um, there's a great deal of land speculation. Stuart Banner has written a book uh, that details a lot of this. Um, court, and courts uh, provide incentives to speculate on land. You can, you can claim ownership of land that the U.S. government doesn't even own, speculating that the U.S. government will own it in 30 years, and then you'll have, you'll have the best, the best uh, opportunity to grab it. Um, so that's, that's one where and this, and this just allows for a rush of land speculation involving George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and really any famous person whose name is on a building anywhere uh, around the United States uh, prior to the 1800s. Um, thanks. And then the final minute is uh, a couple others. Institutional enabling. Uh, capitalist exchange that was mentioned in the last panel. Uh, documentation and mapping, as Chris Tomlins has written uh, extensively about. Uh, establishing, asserting precedent. Asserting precedent that denies opportunities for Cherokee. Uh, the Cherokees were represented by lawyers in numerous cases where the lawyers themselves asserted precedents or accepted precedents that the Cherokees themselves did not accept. And because their lawyers accepted them, it went on record as that they had accepted these early precedents. Right, so the establishment of this, the ability uh, to use this. Uh, and then the final, which actually Laura, I would just say, Laura, she talks about the role of local and state courts. Uh, state courts and local courts are incredibly important here. Georgia has a completely different definition of the Commerce Clause. And although that definition comes into confrontation with the Supreme Court, um, there are many, many years in which this property law is taken and land is taken. And by the time it goes to the Supreme Court, there's, it, the process has already occurred. Right? The procedural aspects, the taking, uh, has already taken place. So the conclusion of this is by the time we have the famous Trail of Tears, we're dealing actually with a very small population of indigenous people that are left. Um, and the fight over, over in, the, in the Worcester case um, that solidifies the end of this process, this is all, it is already over. And it's over because of the ways in which both politics and courts have already enabled the taking. Right? This is a final symbolic event, but it, it, it was already gone. Thank you very much. made a very clever suggestion, which is that we take our break now because she needs to set up a PowerPoint presentation that she needs to warm up. And then we'll go right from Mariana to Bob Gordon's comments and then after that to discussion. So, um, Ray, no more than 15 minutes. For your personal delay. I thought it was for me because I had a group of that. <laughs> it isn't really a book of fun because it's a random case. Which is <laughs> not the same as a program. Is this for me? Most of them. It's a random page. I don't know. They may not be especially significant. Yeah. It isn't. Well, I'm very keen on this. So I'm going to say this. Internships in Brazil. That's changed. It wasn't anywhere near as rich. At least for a little while, they much the same. Are you about to, to resume, Mariana? Oh, sure. Okay. Let's, I'm just going to go and make sure we've got everybody out of the lobby, and then we'll start. <laughs> the last part of the last session. Mariana. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, um, so, uh, as many of you will know, um, the whole area of Aboriginal rights is one that I've been a complete newcomer to, but I uh, decided to run the risk of doing a, a, an amateur job because I think that in terms of the questions that this conference asked us to address, I don't think there is a more important issue. I don't think there's an issue 
for which you could say that it's more important to understand how it is that history became law, how history was turned into law, how might uh, actually became right, but at the same time how the same history and the same law are now being used as resources by people who are trying to move in that direction which Walter Benjamin called the, the uh, direction of justice, which is the one that looks forward and backward at the same time. So, in the first section, I'll briefly outline the challenges posed to the Canadian legal systems epistemological conventions by the Supreme Court decision to compel trial judges to allow and give some weight to knowledge formats previously regarded as mythical. Like many other Canadians, I was favorably impressed by the court's willingness to critique the Eurocentric assumptions of its own evidentiary rules, and my initial motive in researching this paper was a simple one of finding out how subsequent courts had interpreted and applied the rather vague judicial statements about evidence in Aboriginal formats. And I, I stress it's the formats that were at issue, not, you know, not the content. Um, evidence in Aboriginal formats that were made in the famous 1997 decision um, whose name you have here. Um, now this proved to be less than simple, but in any case, it turned out that um, the most important recent cases affecting the collective rights of Aboriginal peoples, which are those developing the new doctrine of the duty to consult, do not turn on either the substance or the format of the evidence presented by Aboriginal nations. Instead, these cases set out to discover truths not about Aboriginal peoples or their history or their law, but about the elusive entity that is the Crown. In pursuing the question of whether the Crown has a duty to consult Aboriginal peoples and attempt to accommodate their interests, and the answer has been yes, and I stress interest because it's the interest more than the legal rights that uh, is activated by the duty to consult. Um, various courts have, consciously or not, engaged in an interesting epistemological labor that can be described as refurbishing the crown. The duty to consult jurisprudence contains an interesting paradox that has thus far gone unnoticed in the literature. The traditional oral narratives that were at issue um, as whether they were admissible or not in the Delgamo case, had long been dismissed by Euro-Canadians, judges included, as myths or legends. But the story that the new jurisprudence tells about the crown, about its sovereign power and its self-imposed obligations, is not a story composed of facts or of law. It is rather a magical invocation of the crown's inherent features and virtues. The noted legal scholar and Ojibwe leader John Burroughs remarked concerning the Delgamo case that despite the cheers of victory with which Aboriginal leaders greeted the decision, the key political effect of the decision is to perform what he called an alchemy, um, and as, as he says in the title of his article, the conjuring of sovereignty. But it seems to me that the more recent cases on the duty to consult feature white judges playing an even more of a magician or shaman-like uh, role. Then the conclusion will consider how the crucial role played in Canadian law by the honor of the Crown Doctrine has a constitutive effect on the much trumpeted <coughs> white Aboriginal reconciliation process in which Canada, like Australia, is officially engaged. So, um, the first section, knowledge formats and the performativity of narratives. Um, I'm here going to use John Borrow's own summary of the link between the knowledge formats and the actual substantive claims of an Aboriginal title that were being made. So I, I quote here. In Delgamook versus British Columbia, the Supreme Court of Canada considered the Gitsan and, and Wet'suwet'en peoples claim to Aboriginal title and self-government over approximately 58,000 um, square kilometers of land in what is now called Northwest British Columbia. Um, both nations have lived in this, era, in, in this area as distinct people for a long, long time prior to sovereignty. And, uh, sovereignty always appears in these cases of time, which is sort of quite peculiar, before and after sovereignty. Um, for millennia, uh, I'm continuing with the quote, for millennia their histories have recorded their organization into houses, 
and plans in which hereditary chiefs have been responsible for the allocation, administration, and control of traditional lands. Within these houses, chiefs pass on important histories, songs, crests, lands, ranks, and properties from one generation to the next. The passage of these legal, political, social, and economic entitlements is performed and witnessed through feasts. These feasts substantiate the territory's relationships. So that's the end of the quote. The trial judge decided that many, though not all, of the narratives of origin and possession uh, that were told by the house chiefs were admissible. But he then proceeded to deprive them of weight because they were a mix of myth and reality. And he also refused to admit oral evidence in the form of territorial affidavits. In addition, a crucial fact that many commentaries omit to mention is that even those narratives that were said to be admissible were allowed in as exceptions to the hearsay rule, a classification that clearly has the effect of making them structurally inferior to the usual expert affidavits presented by historians and anthropologists. Mindful of the loud accusations of racism that had greeted the trial judge's ethnocentric dismissal of the aboriginal narratives, the Supreme Court's judgment used the discursive and textual conventions that are used to perform Canadian multiculturalism to explain to the Canadian public the Gitsan term adat, if that's how um, it's pronounced, I'm not sure, which is a narrative performed at feasts by chiefs with performative effects, and the Wet'suwet'en term kungaks, which is a song with similar performative qualities. Then Chief Justice Antonio Lamer, himself an embodiment of Canadian multiculturalism, chastised the trial judge as follows, and I quote, the implication of the trial judge's reasoning is that oral history should never be given any independent weight. I fear that if this reasoning were followed, the oral histories of Aboriginal peoples would be consistently and systematically undervalued by the Canadian legal system, end of quote. But Lemaire allowed the trial judge to stay face by pointing out that he did not have the benefit of his, that is Lemaire's, um, earlier decision in Van Der Peet, a British Columbia Aboriginal fishing rights case, which had laid down more generous, rule, generous rules regarding Aboriginal knowledge formats. And here's just a quote from Van Der Peet. A court should approach the rules of evidence and interpret the evidence that exists with a consciousness of the special nature of Aboriginal claims and of the evidentiary difficulties in proving a right which originates in times where there were no written records of the practices, customs, and traditions engaged in. And so on. And I should, uh, you know, perhaps add a footnote here. Up until very recently, it had been thought that any fiduciary obligations that the Crown has or any Aboriginal title you might be able to claim had to be found in the text of the Royal Proclamation of 1763 or some treaty or something. But in these recent cases, the courts have said that actually Aboriginal rights are rooted in Aboriginal people's own history and law, which is clearly potentially very disruptive of the whole system. Um, the Delta Book decision built on Van Der Peet's vague multiculturalist exhortation by providing slightly firmer wording on the question of Aboriginal uh, songs and narratives. So Justice Lamaire chastised as a trial judge for dismissing territorial affidavits on the grounds that they had been actively discussed in communities for many years rather than lying statically in archives, which is what the trial judge really wanted them to have done. To discount narratives because they're modified and revised into telling has the effect of making it impossible for an oral culture to prove its claims in court, he pointed out. The net effect of applying the standards used for historical documents to oral, oral narratives may be that a society with such an oral tradition would never be able to establish a historical claim through the use of oral history, end of quote. However, just how the Chief Justice would have weighed evidence in the form of Adak and Kungas is a question that was never answered, because in the end, the court simply ordered a new trial, and also urged the parties to negotiate politically uh, rather than relitigate, um, which to tell you know to make a very long story short, is what was actually already happening on the ground. So while the Dalton case was going on, the province of British Columbia decided to actually go against its own history and start negotiating treaties with Aboriginal nations. The most famous one being the Nishka Treaty, which I give you a little example of here. Um, 
And more worryingly, subsequent court rulings do not consistently follow the exhortations to not treat oral evidence as if it were composed of documents. In the 2001, uh, I guess, a, yeah, in, in the 2001 decision in the Mitchell case that was launched by Ontario, Ontario Mohawks, newly appointed Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin again repeated a multiculturalist incantation, which to Canadian ears is like mother but an apple pie, it's so completely uncontroversial. So she said, quote, judges must resist facile assumptions based on Eurocentric traditions of gathering and passing on historical facts, blah, blah, blah. But then she followed this by a qualification that amounted to a negation, warning that, quote, there is a boundary that must not be crossed between a sensitive application and a complete abandonment of the rules of evidence. And the key term here is, of course, the rules of evidence. So evidence of Aboriginal title does not have to look like evidence in a private tort case, um, but, quote, neither should it be artificially strained to carry more weight than it can reasonably support. Um, in addition, in one notable case, the use of wampum belts as legal objects backfired rather badly. Uh, Chief Stephen Augustine, who you see here, um, and, his, and, and his people um, argued that a wampum belt that was an important, um, you know, it was both law and a representation of law, was made in the 17th century, and they took the trouble to make an exact replica to bring to court, the original being unavailable in the Vatican archives. <laughs> da Vinci code, sorry. Um, however, an anthropologist hired by the federal government went to the Vatican and had the original belt tested by Western experts. He then testified that the belt was made in the 19th century, not in the 17th, and that it had been given by Aboriginals in Quebec and not in Nova Scotia to the Pope. <laughs> this is true. Um, so now this was taken as undermining not only the evidentiary value of the belt, but more worryingly also the credibility of Chief Augustine. So the court concluded that while the chief was thoroughly truthful, his evidence was in error. Thus, 13 years after Delgamuk, the legal implications for Aboriginal peoples of the judicial exhortations of avoiding Eurocentric assumptions are still unclear. However, given that law, perhaps especially in Canada, can have a constitutive effect on culture and politics, it is worth pausing for a minute to consider the marked seriousness with which some non-Aboriginal Canadians are now treating not only Aboriginal claims about rights and about power, but Aboriginal knowledge formats more generally. An interesting example is found in the unusual textual practices that were used by Justice um, Vickers, who heard over 300 days of testimony concerning the land claims of the Chilcotin Nation. Obviously moved by what he had seen and heard, the judge, judge chose to begin his formal judgment with a long preface that was on for about two pages, acknowledging the essential work performed by interpreters and word spellers. Then, instead of recounting the facts of the case, he opens the actual decision with um, a declaration that links Aboriginal peoples to Canada's official policy of multiculturalism. So, para, uh, so the first paragraph of the decision begins as follows, I quote, Canada's multicultural society did not begin when various European nations colonized North America. Rather, multiculturalism on this continent had its genesis thousands of years ago. Um, so today's modern multicultural communities seldom, if ever, look back at the aboriginal roots of Canadian diversity. And this could be seen from a cynical perspective as ethnocentrically inscribing the official Canadian religion of multiculturalism in the time immemorial of Aboriginal customary law. However, it could also be read somewhat more uh, you know, charitably as teaching the readers of judgments, who are lawyers, not to think of Aboriginals as a single group and to think of them as diverse within themselves. And in keeping with this, what he did was proceed to educate the lawyers to read cases in the specificities of Chilcotin history and temporality. 
And I would love to know what the anthropologists in the room who are familiar with other instances of judicial anthropology think of this particular example, because I'm only familiar with Canadian examples of multiculturalist, sort of nice social democratic um, um, you know, judicial anthropology. All right, so to, uh, to go on to uh, the second uh, um, half. A recent line of cases has established a relatively new duty to consult, primarily in regard to natural resource de development, that may have more significant financial implications for Aboriginal peoples than the epistemologically and legally laborious establishment of Aboriginal title. So the leading case on this, which is Haida Nation versus British Columbia, uh, you know, puts the case um, as follows, I quote, the government's duty to consult with Aboriginal peoples and accommodate their interests, again, it's interests, not just rights, so even if they haven't formulated rights, they, their interests will need to be uh, you know, protected. So the government's duty is grounded in the honor of the crown. And I naively thought it was grounded in the past injustices suffered by others, but it turns out it isn't. Um, so the view that it's the honor of the crown that is responsible for expanding the opportunities for Aboriginal peoples to earn uh, you know, royalties in mining and lumber and also to uh, be involved in participating in the management of natural resources is always presented without chapter or verse. A typical text from Van der Piet reads as follows, quote, the crown is a fiduciary obligation to Aboriginal peoples with the result that in dealings between the government and Aboriginals, the honor of the crown is at stake. Because of this fiduciary relationship and its implications for the honor of the crown, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's no footnote after honor of the crown. Um, now, this duty to consult doctrine is not, strictly speaking, new. It, it has always been read into the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and it, in general, if you look at the sort of uh, you know British Empire uh, you know, jurisprudence of the late 19th century, you often see some some sense of a, of a fiduciary obligation. However, in the past, this had, was held to only apply to official Indians, status Indians who were living on 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 reserves. But the new doctrine, precisely because what grounds it is the honor of the crown and not the character or the claims of Aboriginal peoples. Now this duty extends to everyone, all Aboriginal peoples, whether they're on reserves or not, whether they're treaty Indians or not. It's much more extensive. Um, and it also extends to the provincial crown, which is very crucial because it's the provinces that own the natural resources and own the soil. So now suddenly, you know, even the queen and right of British Columbia um, uh, is obliged to do this consultation and accommodation of Aboriginal interests. Um, in the first case, um, establishing this, this duty to consult, which was the Guerin case uh, in 1984, the Muskegon Nation had wanted to lease a good part of its valuable reserve, which was actually in Vancouver itself, to a golf course. Since, since interest in Indian lands, most, most particularly reserves, cannot be alienated except to the Crown, the bank had asked the Department of Indian Affairs to lease the land on its behalf. Anyway, basically they were ripped off by you know, the Department of Indian Affairs, and then uh, eventually they were able to sue the government. Now, the British Columbia Court of Appeal said, oh, once the surrender of the land documents were signed, the Crown could lease to anyone on whatever terms it saw fit, but the Supreme Court found that there was a fiduciary obligation and that this had been breached. Um, and then, in a, um, uh, you know, what the court did there basically is draw a handy distinction between the unfaithful servants of the crown, those bad, uh, you know, bureaucrats, and the crown itself, with the honor of the crown, of course, being attributed wholly to the latter. Um, as, as the court said in Haida, it is always assumed that the crown intends to fulfill its promises. Whether they did actually uh, fulfill them or not, the point is that it's always assumed that they intend that. Um, now, um, 
what I'm really interested in, again, is the question of knowledge format. So I just have to read you um, some quotes from the Haida decision. Quote, the government's duty to consult with Aboriginal peoples and accommodate their interests is grounded in the honor of the Crown. Another paragraph. It is always assumed that the Crown intends to fulfill its promises. Another quote. The honor of the Crown requires that these rights be determined, recognized, and respected. This in turn requires the Crown acting honorably to participate in processes of negotiation. The Crown acting honorably cannot cavalierly run roughshod over Aboriginal interests. The hypnotic repetition of the term, the honor of the Crown, um, you know, contrasts uh, with the striking absence of any reference to authoritative common law or other sources. Um, now, the honor of the crown is unpacked in unusual detail in an interesting text authored by the Treaty Commissioner for the Government of Saskatchewan. His name is David Arnott. In a lecture entitled, The Honor of the Crown, um, <laughs> Mr. Arnott, you can see how I, I found it, I was Googling for this, um, you know, he suggests that rather than be embarrassed by the antique notion of the crown's honor, we, Canadians, should embrace our mystical legal tradition without embarrassment since, quote, the honor of the crown reflects the deepest and oldest layer of our traditions of human rights in Canada. So he says, judges have tended to treat the doctrine as a mere principle of statutory construction, but the phrase is more than that. It is actually, quote, the conscience of the country, end of quote. And I think this fits in with Vicar saying that you can read multiculturalism into the immemorial time of Aboriginal customary law. Now, because I'm in the US, I have to read this quote from Arnett's text. I quote, is it any wonder that American colonists during the 18th century agitations that preceded their revolution appeal to the honor of the crown to protect them from men they described as the king's evil ministers in doing this, they distinguished between the crown per se, which traditionally stood for what is just and honorable, and the government of the day, which is susceptible to corruption and misconduct. Appealing to the honor of the crown was an appeal not merely to the sovereign as a person, but to the traditional bedrock of principles of fundamental justice that lay beyond persons and beyond politics. One of the most curious things about this text is that Erna seems to have forgotten that the American colonists actually rejected the crown itself, and not just the king's misguided ministers. But Arnott is not alone in his refusal to even contemplate the possibility of, of a post-monarchy future for Canada. In a recent article, the noted Aboriginal legal scholar Sakesh Henderson also provides a rather rosy-colored view of the crown in his discussion of the government's duty to consult. So the result of these cases is quite paradoxical. As courts move to partially disavow some of the more racist moments in Canadian law and politics, it turns out that radically changing what counts as evidence of legal possession by admitting Aboriginal knowledges in Aboriginal formats may matter less than peering into the medieval mists to re-describe the crown in terms that make the feudal history of the crown converge with Canadian multiculturalism and Canadian human rights law. And in conclusion, <laughs> um, I suppose if you've been, well, actually, I say that here, the two sides of the Canadian $20 bill. Now, um, you, 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 since these two images are actually the same size, if I showed you a bill now, you'd see they're exactly the same size. They're on either side of the bill. And so it looks as if there's been a reconciliation kind of Australian style between the original peoples and the crown. Because they're the same size, and, um, you know, they're both widely recognized. The Haida carving by, you know, Bill Reed is one of the most disseminated images um, in Canada. But of course, anybody who then examined all the other coins that I have in my pocket would see that it is the face of the queen that makes the money in, into legal tender. And here, I reach out to Roy's paper and, you know, read his paper. And Reed's actually very handy as a tourney bill. Some might say that questioning the ultimate normative ground of the sovereignty of the crown is simply unthinkable, at least to judges. However, the sovereignty of the Canadian federal state is not quite as unshakable as one might think after hearing the hypnotic invocation of the crown. 
Um, for one thing, as the Supreme Court was deciding the Delibu case, the government of Quebec and the government of Canada were sharpening their respective legal knives in preparation for the all-out fight of a sovereignty that was the Quebec secession reference that um, you know, was decided in 1998. Why the visibility of the Quebec sovereignist movement does not seem to have had uh, you know, much effect on perceptions of what is at stake in this struggle over Aboriginal rights is an interesting question that I hope to pursue in, in the future. So here's the conclusion. After canvassing some of the complicated and mainly unwritten doctors about the crown, about the crown in English law, Frederick Maitland was moved to end the matter by stating, quote, as a matter of fact, we know that the crown does nothing but lie in the Tower of London to be gazed at by sightseers, end of quote. But as Maitland documented, one of the most curious things about the crown is that it has the divine, or perhaps the trickster power of being in many places at once. So it can be in the Tower of London being gazed at by sightseers. It can be in the hand of Queen Elizabeth as she signs a law. And at the same time, it can be in the Queen of Right, the Queen in Right of Canada, which is the other name for uh, you know, the federal government, the Queen in Right of British Columbia, and so on. Maitland's ghost might be interested to know that one of the most effective incarnations of the crown today is that which we which we can discern in the roving rooms of the Supreme Court of Canada, where the crown is being quietly retrofitted so that it goes better with the new multicultural decor of the nation state, but in such a way as to firm up, rather than undermine, the normative fact of colonial, the, the normative affirmation of the fact of colonial conquest and domination. Thank you. Actually, the proceedings of the conference have uh, rather reminded me strongly of another set of legal realists whose uh, spirit I'd like to invoke as kind of presiding the uh, spirits floating kind of like butterflies over this <laughs> conference. The, um, the, the ones I have in mind are um, uh, the ones I have in mind are uh, the uh, uh, Wesley Hofeld, uh, Robert Hale, um, the uh, the Coens. Um, not the brothers who make the movies, but the <laughs> Morris and Felix, father and son, uh, Thurman Arnold. Um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The, um, the panel is called Reassessing Sovereignty. Uh, what we have lots of examples here of are of the uh, first of all, delegated sovereignty. This is what brings to mind Morris Cohen, the, the elder, the, and his famous book on property as sovereignty. Property is simply nothing more than delegation of state power to private owners the, of, um, of the powers the, and, um, uh, and resources of, of government. The um, uh, delegated sovereignty, as I'll say in a moment, is all over these uh, papers. The, uh, there's uh, the notion of the multiplicity of sovereigns, or legal pluralism, the, a very strong interest of the younger Cohen, Felix, 
the, uh, in his administration of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and is a great promoter of, uh, the, of uh, uh, the rights of Indian tribes. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Hofeld, the influence is most felt in the very large number of examples the, of, um, the, of what Hofeld uh, described as the legal relation of no right. The, uh, of privileges and immunities. The privileges being uh, delegations of state power in the form of permissions, permissions to act freely, even to act in such a way as inflicts harm on others. The uh, correlative privilege being immunities, that is to say that even if you do act in such a way, nobody can legally, nobody can legally stop you. Uh, these papers are full of uh, privileges. And in another form, the, uh, of these of these privilege comes in comes in what uh, Marianne Constable calls legal silences. Uh, the law doesn't say you can't do it. Therefore, maybe you can. The uh, the uh, uh, and also in um, in the form of exclusions. The law is an instrument for creating law-free zones, like designation of enemy combatants as people who can be locked up in a place without law, such as. Guantanamo. The, um, the uh, law, uh, of course, as the famous site of contestation, that is to say, as a medium for fighting about, uh, about sovereignty, is everywhere in these papers. Um, and uh, the uh, law also as a uh, law also as a, as a means whereby the state and legal system um, uh, whereby the state and legal system um, the, uh, uh, grants out the uh, makes dural persons by granting out names and categories, it sorts people into class of, uh, classes and ranks, and also personifies dural subjects. It endows them with rights and powers. The uh, Ritu had a wonderful example of uh, the uh, of law in British India endowing um, idols such as Shiva with dural. Powers. Um, the uh, other examples the are abundant uh, here of defining persons and defining legal agents to represent them. Um, the uh, and law, of course, is also uh, as Norman Spaulding um, and um, uh, Mariana the have provided us as uh, the is uh, law, law is a medium which generates the possibility and the resources to resist its imposition. Anyone who makes a legal claim is likely to be met, like met with somebody asserting a defense or a counterclaim to that uh, uh, to that claim, and so the mere exercise of power delivers to people who are resisting it some resource through legal form uh, delivers to people who are resisting it uh, the uh, the uh, power to uh, power to resist it. Um, the, to go from the from uh, the very general to the specific here, let me talk a little bit about each of these um, of each of these papers. So I should also mention um, popular sovereignty, the uh, not as an abstraction, but um, as um, the uh, but as a series of examples of uh, lawmaking by ordinary by ordinary people. Um, the now. Um, uh, Paul Frank, I, I've got these in a kind of an arbitrary order, which is just the order in which I read the papers, um, which doesn't correspond to the order in which they were presented. Um, the Paul Frimer is a fascinating paper on building an American empire. The focus is on law as an instrument of aggressive imperial expansion via uh, mostly inconspicuous and delegated forms of sovereignty. The uh, government had two big assets. Uh, one was the power to legalize, to ratify, to clothe with legitimate authority the, by granting out or delegating or immunizing or choosing to tolerate the private action. And it had land, which could be traded for performance of empire expanding acts, of which the primary one was ridding the territory of its previous inconvenient inhabitants. The, um, uh, uh, and um, the uh, poll also explains that you combine the two together and government has the, a third resource, and that is the resource, the, the legitimacy to make claims on potential the land or territory 
the, and the claims themselves can be used as an incentive, as he points out, towards, um, uh, towards speculation. Uh, if it makes the claims, there's some possibility, in fact, even considerable possibility that the claims will be sometime realized, the, and the possibility of their realization uh, is, a, uh, the, uh, is, uh, is an asset which can be traded. The, uh, now, the, the government here is acting very much through delegated powers in the Morris Cohen sense, very much as today military and diplomatic functions of empire are contracted out to mercenaries and proxies, the, uh, and the equivalent to land is, uh, is uh, government largesse. Um, uh, the uh, general funds of the taxpayers. The uh, uh, contracting out government functions um, the, is uh, not a new story here. The, it is, as Paul suggests, the means by which uh, a state with relatively little centralized administrative apparatus the, uh, is able to extend its reach, contracting out government functions through letters of marks and bounties and rights to collect user fees. Uh, land grants and, of course, business corporations um, are among the delegates. Framer has this very interesting example of military veterans used to settle in Indian territory the, uh, and to pacify it by fighting and eliminating its Indian uh, inhabitants. Um, one could add later examples like the, tax, the private tax collection agencies or tax farmers or Pinkertons or company guards, deputies, marshals, or private armies to carry out legalized employer violence against strikers. Members of criminal gangs or dissenting political groups recruited as undercover informants, posse comitatus, lynching parties encouraged by authorities to enforce the racial caste system, and uh, more benignly, uh, in Paul's example, private lawyers enforcing the Civil Rights Act. Um, the uh, uh, usefulness of some of these, obviously, is that you don't have to have your own personnel doing it, but it's also a way of avoiding accountability and limits on uh, limits on contact on the, on, on conduct Andy Jackson's private Tennessee militias the uh, recruited from uh, militias of soldiers uh, uh, marching into into Florida the he also has many examples of uses of private law rules to define property rights uh, doctrines of use and occupancy the uh, the uh, property rights is formed by settlement and cultivation rather than by roaming around. The uh, adverse possession for squatters, actively promoting settlement policies that will change the facts on the ground, cre create de facto possession that will ripen into legal ownership. The, um, the uh, again, Hale and Hofeld, it's as much an exercise of the sovereignty to create no right, legal or de facto immunities, as to have an active bureaucratic state imposing and enforcing rule of plot positive action. The, uh, um, many of the actions that, uh, um, the, uh, that uh, uh, Willard Hearst and Morgan Horowitz were called attention to, the grant of fee simple property rights, the, the grant of rights in that form automatically excludes other claimants. The, uh, it's not just a private action that creates facts on the ground, but it's action instigated and motivated by state policy. The, uh, similar nowadays, you see in uh, Mariana Valverde's work, the, uh, uh, the reverse course of recognizing of Aboriginal rights is enduring under customary law, the, uh, or um, the interpreting treaties as sources of Aboriginal rights. Um, the, the John Witt gives us another series of examples of the use of the international law framework the, um, as sources of rights for the discoverer or conqueror, defining appropriate sovereigns. The, um, the uh, uh, one example that he gives in his paper is the, the, uh, is the states claiming sovereignty by virtue of the fact, under the Commerce Clause, by virtue of the fact that they, uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, that Indians occupy land wholly within their states, surrounded by uh, surrounded by whites, and therefore they claim an exemption from federal regulation under the Federal Commerce Clause. John, what raises another theme, which you also see in Mariana Valverde's narrative, the uh, bringing a social practice under the rule of law, even if to regulate and tame it, the extends it legal recognition. The, this is a, the uh, uh, Valverde's example is that um, uh, if land claims the, are regulated in Canadian court, the, even in a way that's, bizarre, that's relatively the, uh, charitable or generous the, towards the Aboriginal claimants. The, uh, when the court's jurisdiction is recognized, the, uh, the, the sovereignty of the, uh, 
uh, uh, of, the, of the Canadian occupier is recognized uh, as well there. In Witt's case, there's an argument, persistent argument about whether war is just too horrible to try to regulate. The uh, many people look with contempt on the idea of merely having a law of war, the, uh, because it seems to the, uh, it seems to legitimate a practice which um, the, is uh, is too monstrous to even contemplate legitimate. We have a similar debate today about torture, whether torture should be intricately legalized or or firmly kept out of the scope of extra legal conduct. The um, the John tells us that there are two theses, a declension thesis, that is to say, the, uh, there used to be international controls on law controls on 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 war. These have faded, and the novelty theory, the uh, the conduct of warfare is governed as never before by law and lawyers. Uh, he says they're both clearly wrong, and he really uncovers this quite fascinating new wealth of material about contexts and situations in which arguments deriving from the law of war were actually used, and there is simply, uh, there are myriad controversies here and a very rich variety of invocations the, of law of war based arguments, um, the, uh, respecting the rights of British creditors uh, after the war claims to territory in Florida and Texas. The, the, both the declension and novelty theories, John Witt sees as a way of fending off the gruesome past. Um, the, uh, well, his examples are fascinating. Indian wars involve a collision of the norms of military cultures. Indians think mass slaughter is barbaric. The whites think that torture is barbaric. The resort of each side to its favorite, to its favorite relatively civilized tactics makes it seem to the other side even more savage and inhuman. The, uh, there's a huge role in this story for exclusions from the ambit or scope of law. Non-Christian peoples or savages as outside the law of wars. Kent and Wheaton in their international law treatise use the, uh, uh, use the law to exclude Indian conflicts from the scope of the law of war. The, um, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the, there are also populist militias in this story. Here, Witt's story overlaps with Frimer's uh, in its description of the use of militia citizen soldiers to do the work of expanding empire in Florida and, uh, and Texas. The uh, international law figures also as a source of arguments over state building. The uh, Hamilton uses it to try to equip the federal government with unwritten inherent powers. The, um, the slavery question is implicated too. The, uh, could inherent the uh, federal government powers include the power to abolish slavery? The, uh, did war authorize the seizure of private property? The, uh, eventually, of course, war power would provide the initial rationale for emancipation, the, as well as conscription and commandeering of property and goods for civil war efforts. The, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the protection of slavery and private property, ironically, the, uh, John points out, um, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the law of war was often invoked the, uh, the, so that the protection of slavery became, became the chief test of whether an armed conflict was or was not civilized. The, uh, the uh, uh, Mariana Valverde's honor of the crown and Aboriginal land claims um, is again an illustration of how the the uh, default ordinary rules of law controlled who is allowed to define property. Uh, it's also a, a very interesting illustration of how sovereignty is built through the assertion the, of magical powers. Um, the compare the sovereign immunity or king can do no wrong doctrines. Um, the, um, to uh, Ernst Kantorowicz's famous king's two bodies. There's a mortal body of the king and the, and the immortal body of the crown. She, she gives us her example the honor of the crown, the policies of paternalistic protection while maintaining control. The, um, the, uh, the, the great irony of Mariana's presentation, which is, the, uh, 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 as, she, uh, as she points out, is that, uh, is that the courts that are asserting this mystical honor of the crown are courts that are, in, uh, are courts that by and large have been disparaging all of these mythic claims the, uh, uh, in oral tradition to, to land, whereas the assertion of the honor of the crown is grounded in pretty much nothing, as far as anyone can tell. It seems to have no legal provenance besides the assertion that it, the, uh, the robust assertion that it exists. Uh, that doesn't make it unusual. A lot of legal power is built on 
robust assertion the, uh, of, of precisely this kind. One thinks of the small group of the Whig gentlemen meeting in a small room in Philadelphia in private, writing a document which begins, we the people. And uh, there's a classic case of bootstrapping uh, <laughs> uh, uh, going on there. Uh, the, the, uh, so she shows how the rules of evidence in Aboriginal language tend to result in the practice of downgrading oral histories of Aboriginal or Indigenous peoples or their ritual narratives or oral evidence in the form of territorial affidavits, although recently she says there's been a trend to treat them more generously um, the, uh, the, by courts who don't really, however, spell out what this more generous treatment would be, only suggesting um, these quotes are just hilarious, I, you know, that she, that, that she's a simple, always suggesting that they shouldn't, they shouldn't go so far as to risk trashing the ordinary rules of evidence. The, uh, the actual decision still strongly privileged European histories and written documents. Uh, now, she suggests a more promising legal legal for indigenous peoples is found in recent cases saying the Canadian state has a duty to consult them on matters of natural resource development. Source of this duty is not to be found, as she says, in correcting for past injustice, but rather in the honor of the crown, uh, a source of fiduciary duty extended from prior use as applied to Indians living on reservations to Aboriginal peoples and nations generally. Um, the, and uh, the, honor, the federal government, and apparently the provincial governments as well, as well uh, have succeeded to the British crown's duty as benevolent patriarch to protect Indians from greedy settlers and racist provincial governments. The, uh, to the Crown as an undifferentiated unit are described many pleasing characteristics of a quasi-fiduciary. I say quasi because uh, Mariana makes clear that the courts all said the Crown's duties are not to be confused with those of an actual trustee. What those duties are, where they come from, is not explained. As I say, everything's loaded by assertion of these two words, honor and crown. Um, here I have to invoke my own realist, Felix Cohen, and his transcendental nonsense and the functional. <laughs> Uh, approach prone is not any actual existing government or legal system. It is the mystical body the, um, of Kantora that's his king's two bodies, that of the moral man, mortal man, the immortal kingship. The uh, a scholar says it invokes principles of fundamental justice that lie beyond persons and beyond politics. Uh, it is a little hard to think of what legal argument on such, under such a standard looks like. Well, as Mariam says, it's largely a matter of the virtue of the monarch, not the justice of the of, of the claims. But the invocation of the mystical body of the crown strikes me is not altogether unlike the invocation of the founders or the original understanding of the American Constitution, the, um, the, uh, or for that matter, uh, the older classical notion um, of the police power, the, um, um, the, uh, <coughs> the until it was tamed and legalized in the late, in the late 19th century. The, um, uh, or, for that matter, um, from the uh, invocation today of the duties of the president to present, protect the nation of, from threats to its national security, the, an equally mystical, cloudy, and unspecified the, uh, set of, uh, of powers. Um, the, uh, uh, these, are all, these are all concepts uh, uh, the, uh, out of which, as Carlo Ellen said in another context, as, a, as out of a magician's high hat, anything may be taken that is first put in. The, uh, the overarching point, whatever the crown may be, invocation of its duties takes as assumed the resolution of a more fundamental underlying issue that the various successive governments of Canada are sovereign over these nations and territories, uh, the very issue which, of course, is sharply raised by, uh, but much more successfully, by the threat of the Quebecois succession movement, um, the, uh, a real challenge to sovereignty because there are real political needs to carry it out. Laura Edwards, um, the, uh, uh, on the piece, kind of a counter, well, this is a wonderful book, um, which I recommend to anybody who hasn't read it. That's kind of a counterpart to Paul Frimer's project. Frimer starts with the paradigm of government action as produced by a centralized bureaucracy of public officials. Then he shows how government power is contracted out to proxies, delegated, exercised indirectly by creation of incentives, bounties, and preemption rights. The uh, Edwards story challenges another paradigmatic idea of law, the formal law on the books, uh, the, which Ritu has been calling logos, or more formally, the more broadly, the statutes and court decisions of the centralized state. Law made at the hierarchical summit in the metropole, in this image, spreads down to govern Protestants and peripheries. This approach, uh, legal pluralists call this approach legal centralism, 
Uh, this approach, she says, distinguishes law sharply from society, lawmaking and applying from unofficial lawmaking, norm making and enforcing, and particular rules and rights from the peace, a conception of law's order arising from informal patterns the, of, um, the, of settling conflicts. Um, the, uh, Edwards depicts lawmaking with a local order as a kind of collaborative communal endeavor. The uh, ordinary people, all ordinary people in extremely hierarchical social relations, not exactly in the people themselves, says uh, Larry Kramer, um, of the people out of doors, but rather as participants in a process of norm adjustment and enforcement aimed at producing public order and uh, peace. This took place in circuit courts and jury trials, but also in a whole host of other no local legal venues. It's hierarchical, but it also allowed, as she said, a wide range of participation by of subordinates like the poor, women, servants, even slaves. All people who in a more large formal legal system would be shut out as people without rights. Uh, in Edwards' account, this system of local law enforcement exists side by side with and eventually comes to be displaced by a more formal system of law governing property rights, staffed by lawyers, applied regularly and uniformly. Uh, an interesting question arising from this work is whether right, Edwards is right to to characterize legal central societies from local, local societies, or whether or not the all societies have elements of legal centralism and of plural legal order, or broad pockets, or enclaves, or, reservation, or reservations of local informal uh, order. I'm inclined to think more of the latter. That is to say that, uh, that we don't see, with the development of legal centralist institutions, the, uh, an elimination the, of local sources of or pockets. The, uh, of order, we simply see a redistribution uh, of them. Um, the, um, take a look, for example, at Ariella Gross's wonderful stuff on, on race trials. The, uh, we have a method of settling questions of what race people are, which is really quite distinct from anything that's prescribed in the formal legal order. It's a negotiated, um, the, uh, negotiated race identity. The, or performative, as she said. Now, proportion, of course, is of each is a matter of degree. And Laura is convincing when she suggests the missing of legal reformers, very much like modern societies eager to bring the rule of law to less developed societies, was to extend the reach of the formal system so as to occupy and displace the, the local. But along with the extension, the formal system comes a long list of exclusions for protections of the formal law, exclusions for legal personhood and participation in government. And what those exclusions do is to simply redelegate the uh, to um, the uh, redelegate to whom you could call local sovereigns the uh, the power of government the over their uh, over their pockets or or or, or enclaves. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there's a time in English and also in American. The labor law, where if the employer or the employee wants to adjust the labor contract, they have to go together to the magistrate and get it done. The, uh, the magistrate gets kicked out of the picture, law in the official sense, gets kicked out of the picture the, uh, when labor law is simply reassigns essentially the power of governance over the workplace relationship uh, to uh, the employer, nominally to contract de facto to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the employer. The, uh, the, uh, a, a pluralism of sovereigns is preserved, the, uh, but under the guise or the appearance of, uh, of, of contract. And that really is the last point that I want to talk about a little bit. The, the, this, these are the magical powers the, uh, of law to, um, the, uh, to, make, um, uh, to make the state and coercion uh, and its appearance uh, 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 disappear. Law, the, as the as the magician the, um, creating the magic disappearing act. The, uh, the coercion and violence disappear under forms of, uh, of delegated sovereignty and under forms of consent that are, that are legitimated uh, uh, by law. The um, society and custom are constituted and contract are constituted so simply to exclude the, uh, the coercive force of uh, of, 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 state, of state power. And that, I think, is the, the, uh, one of the greatest the, uh, accomplishments of, of law. It's its ability to accomplish its own the, um, vanishing, or appearance of vanishing, the, uh, through the exercise of these, um, of these uh, quite wonderful alchemical uh, uh, powers, so that um, the, all of its coercion and violence disappear in these institutions like, like the market. Uh, or for that matter, uh, the laws of war.
Um, now, the, just to sum up here, these papers are not just interesting as uh, examples of more general theories. Um, that isn't really why we do this work. And that isn't really why we enjoy it, because it resonates, because it, it provides us tremendous illustrations of more general theories. I mean, you know, we're interested in that, but we're most in, mostly interested in the stories the, uh, that uh, are told here. And, uh, and these are extraordinarily interesting ones. The, all four of these papers are, are papers about a researcher looking, the, uh, the, uh, looking like archaeologists for buried cities, the, uh, uncovering them, dusting them off, the, um, and uh, through the power of narrative, bringing their inhabitants uh, to life. The, the recreation of, uh, of forgotten and neglected worlds uh, uh, of experience. Um, um, so strange, so new, uh, but also so oddly familiar. Now, in the case of the nations in British Columbia, they seem to have managed to uh, sort of not wash their dirty laundry in public. So, you know, whatever might have been going on in terms of contestations, uh, you know, there's still a unified thing, which is the nation. And it's an Aboriginal title is about collective rights. There's there's sort of no individual Indians at all. It, it's the collective that is, um, um, you know, given title or given rights, if that's, uh, you know, what the court decides. And, and, and I think that's, that's partly because um, in most of British Columbia, uh, well, there weren't, uh, you know, treaties way back, and there were some reserves, but the whole reserve system didn't work the same way as it did in Eastern Canada. In, in places um, like Ontario, and Quebec, where there's some nations that are really contesting um, how the Indian Act decides who is the leader. There is sort of situations of dual power. For instance, uh, some of the you know Mohawk reservations outside of Montreal. There's the official chief elected under the Indian Act, and then there's what are called um, you know the traditionalists. And they have their own group and their own council. And I think in that case, it would be awfully hard for the government to know who um, to negotiate with. I mean, they'd be obliged to negotiate with the officially elected chief. But there are some sort of dual power situations. But as I said, in British Columbia, I mean, I, I'm not from British Columbia. I don't know that much about the politics there. But it seems to me that in all of the cases I've seen, uh, the traditional uh, you know, chiefs, which are usually hereditary chiefs, are acknowledged as the chiefs both by themselves and by the government. So the issue doesn't really seem to arise there. I suggest that perhaps that's a convenience of the crown rather than a convenience of the tribe. I don't know. I mean, I have to know more, more about the specific cases. But in 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 the cases of uh, you know these British Columbia. Uh, you know, nations, the hereditary chief is the chief for purposes of dealing with, you know, the government, unlike in uh, Eastern Canada, as I said, in which the, the hereditary and, you know, traditional systems were destroyed by the Indian Act, and, you know, any of the tribes that had matrilineal systems were forced to adopt the sort of election of a chief in a kind of more sort of traditional Western way, so 
um, a question of, about the recognition of alternative epistemologies for both um, Mariana and Paul, and, and maybe for, for John. But, um, <coughs> Mariana, um, um, how much purchase do you think the alternative epistemology will turn out to have? Especially if, if the issues with Aboriginal rights are, are um, more managed through the honor of the crown doctrine, the whole notion of trust relationships, you should do this in very hierarchical, very uh, paternal, paternal defined substance. Um, so it, it is, is, this, is this ultimately going to be um, the kind of co optation? Uh, in the duty to consult on uh, natural resource uh, uh, exploitation that we saw from secession treaties uh, in, in the American experience. Uh, a, a lot of money was paid to the various tribes for, um, for huge tracts of land in the secession treaty, but, um, but clearly uh, it wasn't a, a vehicle to uh, access to political um, and that's, that's for you and that's for Paul. Yes. Um, <clears throat> have you had a chance yet to look at charity sources? Uh, for example, the, the charity newspaper, which was in production before the Trail of Tears, um, and uh, more recently, uh, Robert Connolly's History of the Charities, which was commissioned by the Cherokee Nation and somewhat earlier. Bernard uh, Strickland's monograph on Cherokee history, which was also commissioned by the Cherokee Nation, and in which both Conway and Strickland uh, try to draw on um, fragmentary oral tradition uh, evidence to speculate about how the, um, how the uh, Cherokees experienced the, the, the whole series and process of the session treaties. Um, yeah, very briefly, um, um, the duty to consult cases don't decide anything. They just sort of push the government into specific uh, you know, negotiations. And so each of them is different, and some nations have more political savvy and power than others. But in, I think, pretty much all of the cases that are ongoing or have been um, all, all the treaties or agreements that have been, uh, you know, reached. It isn't just money; it's money and power. So, for instance, the Haida Nation has this system of co-governance for this huge area that used to be a national park, and even what it's called now is sort of uh, uh, in question because for the Haida, it's not some nature reserve. <laughs> so, uh, in many cases, they have the right to co-manage with the government the natural resources. So they're not, this, these aren't like the old treaties where the Aboriginal nations are bought off with money and you know, that was that. So there is political power being achieved, but it's completely different in each kind of situation. And, um, and the negotiations don't go on in public. It's not like a court case, right? So you don't necessarily know what was proposed and why they decided what they did and all of that. But the natural resource companies are absolutely up in arms, like just going on about how no one's house is safe. And I mean, in, in British Columbia, this is like the issue of the day. Um, <clears throat> no, I'm not. Uh, I'd like to. Um, I've read uh, Deborah Rosen has written a number of works in this area that's been really helpful. But, I, um, but I'd like to. Ariella, will you next? Working? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is also for, uh, for Paul, though other um, John, other Maria might want to comment, but I was thinking about um, the <laughs> chronological move of backing up from that you know, turn of the century moment when we're um, used to thinking about U.S. imperialism, and, and that for that period, um, which is um, the one where, where I know the most about it, um, you can really see parallels in with um, federal policies uh, towards um, the internal, you know, sort of internal colonialism and then 
and then external um, in terms of land practices and the relationship to race. You, you can see some of the same things that they're doing in India territory going on when they go to Hawaii and other. Um, and I'm and I was trying to think for the earlier period whether you saw. Um, whether there were other of those connections that, that you noticed or that you might be thinking about, and I don't know whether that would be um, it, in terms of, um, uh, I, I don't know, but, but just to thinking about um, geographically or with different um, groups, whether you're, whether you're finding any of those parallels, maybe through the Mexican War or, um, um, because one of the things I think that is um, to do the kind of integration that, that John's talking about, right, will um, involve the, looking at the ways um, these practices are, are you know, getting reiterated in, in these different places, probably in different ways. But, um, but it was hard for me to think of examples in an earlier period that I thought we might have. Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I, one of the arguments, I'm hesitating in part because the, um, uh, the parallels right now that, that are easier for me to make are between the early period and, and the more recent modern period. So, um, you know, my knowledge of the 1890s is um, uh, Eric Love has a new book on Hawaii, um, uh, which is really good, and um, Julian Goh also has a book on the Philippines. So. Um, so there's this, this first set of work out there that I'm still, still uh, making sense of. Um, one thing I think that, that's interesting, I don't know if this will answer the question directly or not, um, but um, one thing I think that's interesting about empires is there's a constant combination of um, democratic aspirations and conquering that are, that are both, that both get intertwined throughout this. And it seems, I mean, this is why I think it's going to be exciting also to study Liberia, right? Liberia is a humanistic, the idea, right, is a humanistic endeavor. Um, the discussion about indigenous tribes is a combination of that. The discussion of Iraq, if you take George Bush at his word, is a combination of that. And, it's, and even to laugh at George Bush, you know, we had Samantha Power and others who, at least before the war, you know, thought about these ideas of humanitarian missions. So I think one of the things that's interesting, and, and guiding behind this and lurking behind this is, the, the democratic elements of American law, right? There are, there are multiple sides of the American legal tradition that can fuse together when it comes to empire and can su support the promotion of expansion because both sides have a desire, I mean, for very different reasons, have a desire to enter into new territories and to claim those territories that they have to have. Cool, go ahead. Yeah, it was just a, a really quick response to that to come back to something Bob said, which is about Morris Cohen and property and sovereignty. It's just um, thinking, I think, about the um, land policies the, um, and that, that combination that you're talking about, because so much of um, federal Indian policies of allotment, um, which was one of the strategies for the, for the southeastern tribes, you know, um, breaking and then of course it's much more widely used later in the, in the 19th century but um, you know we'll make you a citizen you'll get your individual plot of land you'll be a yeoman farmer um, this is a great ideal for everyone of course we're also going to extinguish your <laughs> governmental powers your sovereignty we're gonna we're gonna transform all your sovereignty into property um, property that's great you know sovereignty forget it and but so I think there's something really also productive there, thinking about that combination. Yeah, and you know, to add on that, I mean, you see debates about that in international courts now with the Brazilian rainforest, where U.S. companies went in, made these property issues, um, and then the sovereignty is you know disappears. It becomes property battles between people who own land and American corporations. And so, but by putting it around that debate, it put in international courts that are heavily influenced by American. A variety of American ideals really, you know, pushes it very far in one direction. John, did you want to say something? 
no, no. Oh, great. Right. No, I just uh, I realized I'd cut you yeah. off. All right, so another question. <laughs> All of the papers, I think, explicitly or implicitly sort of deal with this idea that um, epistemology is a form of state sovereignty. What epistemological choices you make determines how sovereignty goes. And sort of responding to, I guess, John's point that um, you know, it's hard to situate legal history institutionally. But one of the places where it's very clearly situated are all these um, land rights battles. And I'm, I've litigated a number of these cases, mainly Mexican land grants in the Southwest. And, um, we always have this problem of, well, is the court going to like the anthropological evidence better or are they going to like the sort of classic legal evidence better? Mm -hmm. And we've been much more successful with um, arguing um, use of fraud and French law than we have customary <laughs> law. So in, in, in southern Colorado, we had a big land rights case that came to the Colorado Supreme Court in uh, 2002 and um, essentially involved raising rights on former common lands of a Mexican land grant. And um, it was now occupied by a ski resort. And the owners of the ski resort did not want people to graze their cattle on the ski resort, even though we offered to say, well, you only use the ski resort in the winter. Maybe we could graze our cattle in the summer because that's when the cattle go there. But they, they didn't want that. They wanted to speak in terms of fee simple. So the anthropological evidence that was presented was essentially uh, of custom was rejected as uh, sort of evidence of prescription was rejected, wasn't considered uh, a, 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 a easy enough to verify. But they like the court, the Colorado Supreme Court, decided our favor because we presented all these arguments under the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, guaranteed property rights. And of course, property as understood in 1848 included Roman law and French law use of fraud. And so that worked. And so, you know, you, you raise these a lot of interesting ethical questions, right? In order to get the, their rights, the people on this grant had to sort of use a common law, a lot of well, common law and civil law, uh, a European construct, right? But they did it in order to, to win. So are they abandoning sovereignty or not? I mean, that's a very open question, but I, I think it's interesting with legal history, one of the ways, when I teach property, one of the ways that you can argue to your students that legal history is relevant is you can say, look, there are these cases that are going on all over the all over the United States, all over the world, including Newport Bay. That's how Newport Bay was kept out of development, by reference to Spanish law. The islands were considered uh, essentially the equivalent of public trust under Spanish law. So these are these are sort of back and forth issues, but I think that sort of for lawyers, the epistemological, epistemological choices kind of uh, uh, determines to some extent your, your choice of, of, of how you're going to work with, uh, with sovereignty, where sovereignty is going to, uh, to end up. Roy? Um, this is for Laura and Mariana. Um, it's a question about tone and the sort of tone vis-a-vis -vis patriarchy. So it seems like both of you are talking about um, possibilities for uh, very reductive, something good out of, out of patriarchy. And for Mariana, you're saying at times it seems like there's going to be more to be had by relying on this sort of very much bigger of another model of the crown, using it strategically, and but then you seem to be very ironic about those possibilities. And Laura, you seem to be um, sort of nostalgic about the patriarchy of peace at, at certain times, especially when you say that. I, I, I find it really hard to say I'm, I'm nostalgic for slavery. I, yeah, no. <laughs> no. Okay. So, but well, that would be that would be no. well. But, so uh, let me uh, take a, a very specific example. Of something you said, which is when rights and rights discourse becomes more uh, more the the mode of legality, mm -hmm. um, that heightens inequality. So. Now, I'm, I'm talking about tone. I don't think that you're nostalgic actual, for actual slavery. This is the, that's definitely not the point. What I'm trying to get at is what the, it is basically what are, what are the attitudes about the piece that, uh, that come out of the, the tone of writing about it? And I thought the, the, the two of you could actually right. converse with that. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's really easy to slip into a either uh, a narrative progression or declension. And so we want to see something, and generally that's how these, these tales are told, right? Um, we either have a progression towards more rights, good, or we have a critique of rights where 
you know, right somehow that's bad. It's the liberal society somehow produces more inequalities. And I, I don't know that that is a good narrative to fall into. In fact, I always tell my undergraduates the progression declension narrative, if you find yourself using progress or things get better, then that's the point where you need to step back and think about the frameworks that you're using. And what I would like to suggest here is that um, we need to think critically about the narrative of rights. And that has been used, I think, fairly uncritically in some ways when we talk about the extension of rights to people as if somehow extending rights is the answer. You got to knock yourself out with it there. Um, and this is a good thing. And I think that that narrative is based on some assumptions we make about how we tell that story, sort of the founding places where we start, the idea that, that somehow we have, these people have no rights, then you have rights over time, and that's a good thing. If you retell that story in a way that, that talks about a different kind of legal system, a very different logic where it sort of confounds some of the things we associate with rights, like inclusion within the legal system, and people are included. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? If you're African American and you're in the South and you're included in the legal system, that means you're included to be regulated, right? Um, so to be excluded then um, when you don't have rights also takes on different means. It's a more complicated story here. And one that also I think causes us to sit back and think about the meanings we attach to rights. And we all know that rights in and of themselves can also be about exclusions, can be about hierarchies, right? And property, that's what it's about. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's rights that are establishing who has things who don't, it establishes inequalities. And if you think about rights in those terms, and you think about extending rights to people, I think you have a much more complicated history. And that's what I want to emphasize. Less that, ooh, patriarchy is good, uh, because it included people, uh, and more to think about absolutely that rights are problematic and it's the meanings you attach to them that are really important, not just the granting of them. So I want to complicate both sides of that story. And um, I think sometimes when people assume that I'm saying that patriarchy is somehow good, that that may be that, that narrative of progress that we like to impose on this whole, uh, this whole history, which I think is really problematic and obscures, I think, some of the fundamental difficulties of obtaining equality in the society. And, and if I can, um, you know, proceed from there. Um, uh, you know, two things. First, the logic of rights, exactly as, you know, Laura was explaining, the logic of individual rights in particular is as alien to the aboriginal legal traditions as the paternalist logic of the honor of the crown, in fact, even probably more so. So in terms of epistemological incompatibilities, I mean, I don't see any principal reason why using rights discourse is, some, uh, is somehow more culturally sensitive than mm -hmm. using, you know, the honor of the crown. And certainly Aboriginal peoples always say, well, whatever works anyway, it's their game, it's their rule, so we'll use whatever works, which I think is, you know, exactly the right answer. Um, so that's, you know, point one, and I'm glad you asked that because I, I only sort of put in one quote in which somebody was sort of reading human rights back into Aboriginal law, and I was hoping people would see how ridiculous that is. But, um, but the second thing is that I, I, I think the word patriarchy is quite wrong for what I'm talking about. The honor of the crown um, is certainly paternalist, but it's also maternalist. and. If you look at the whole discourse of the Hudson's Bay Company and the treaties that were sort of signed in British Columbia in the 1840s, is the image of Queen Victoria as the mother of the empire that hovers over this whole you know, part of the world, uh, particularly in British Columbia. As I said, uh, I think Ontario and you know, Quebec are very different. They, they had a different history of colonization and treaty making. And you know, George III was sort of the, the, the sovereign there. So there is this image of Queen Victoria that I think historians of India have sort of written about, which has this kind of interesting multifaceted, uh, you know, persona. And to this day, there are Aboriginal legal scholars who claim that the British Crown owes fiduciary duties to the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. Why? Because the Aboriginal peoples of Canada were never consulted about the British Crown giving up most of its powers to the Canadian government, which I think is a fascinating argument. So they were consulted about the fact that Canada was formed. Hey, you owe us at least a, a whole lot of money with interest. 
since 1867. <laughs> now, I, I think that's a really interesting, because that's sort of taking advantage of the multiple personalities of the crown in a really yeah. interesting way. Yeah. I mean, other people said, of course, I mean, I mean, this, there was an attempt to litigate this by a group of Alberta um, Indian nations, and the British Court of Appeal just dismissed this as ridiculous. Oh, what do you mean the British crown owes you anything? Forget it. But I, I think the argument can be made that because they weren't consulted about the formation of Canada, you know, something's still owing, and I'd love to see some British lawyer try and litigate this. <laughs> yes. To, uh, to, here we, to John Witt, I'm Mike McEntee, a patent trial lawyer, and I face a similar situation as you do, 100,000 pages of primary materials, and you know they, it's in there, that one page you want. Uh, <laughs> so we come out of metaphysical, conceptual, and go down to how do, as a method of legal history, we use four by six cards. <laughs> do you, I mean, have to, just, it would be useful to know how do you work when facing that material? Uh, 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 for a very long time, this is why it takes years. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I don't use four by six cards anymore. They're these wonderful little, uh, you know, digital four by six cards. Right. Uh, they work much better. You can search them and all sorts of fun things. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is. I mean, in some ways, this so a different way to approach this. So, so I was describing um, uh, so many fields. In which the excuse me, in which the the the, it's not, the the problem for legal history is not the lack of a theoretical apparatus to make sense of it, but rather just the sort of um, person hours to spend the time to learn about what's going on there. And one of the thing, one of the areas in which this is this problem is most acute is in the the, the 20th century administrative state, where the the masses of material are so huge and so mind dulling. That, that to make useful sense of the material, such that one reader might find her way to the end of what you've written about this, is just <laughs> extraordinarily difficult. So not only the process of, of, of identifying, of finding the, the, your one page, or the, finding the, 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 the pages in your 100,000 uh, files that would be uh, useful, but then communicating that material to someone in a way that, that, um, that makes sense. So, so writing the history of the administrative state whether it's in patents uh, or uh, uh, or elsewhere, seems to me to be a challenge that that uh, you know we haven't really answered yet. There are some really good starts going on. So the work that Dan Ernst is doing at Georgetown is really excellent. Um, administrative uh, history, Rule Schiller, um, you know, a little bit to the north of here, is doing really great uh, stuff. I I shouldn't have started naming names. I'm like scanning the audience for historians <laughs> of administrative state. Um, uh, uh, so. Um, so I, I don't know. That, that, I, I, sort of, I sympathize with you. There's no, there's no good answers. I don't know. The <laughs> technique. That, okay, now you've gone through. You've got your hundred thousand. Yeah. Do you create cards for each item that you have? <laughs> so, so I have an, an end note entries for, for <laughs> the, 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 the items. But, but the, 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 the challenge is to, to craft a question that will make the material light up. Right, because if you don't have a question, then 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 you're going to be in the hundred thousand pages forever. So you start with the hypothesis. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 there. yeah. Yeah. Very similar to what all of you have been trying to do for two days. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a hypothesis? <laughs> Dirk in the back. I'm actually, I want to. I need to do it. For, just play off of what John just said, and that is the apology. Maybe, maybe. I think one, as one thing, this is maybe to shift to a kind of more general comment about the, uh, okay, okay. well, okay, um, it, that, it, as one thinks about what is, how to talk about the next new thing, one of the things that's been remarkably absent, and Paul did it, but others, is talk about names, and naming names, I mean, talking historiographically, and talking who are you building on and who are you critiquing? There's been a lot of description of generic or abstract things to overcome, but relatively little direct either building on or challenging. And I think actually 
it actually, it, it, it strikes me, obviously, there's a large pressure to write general books that the general public will read that will not, that, that in which the editor will always tell you, I the historiography. Um, but in this group, actually, what we want is the, the stuff that the editors don't want. We want those names, we want the sense of who, who is going to be killed in order to have the new world come into, into being, right? Who has to be destroyed? And, and so I, and this is, I, I guess it's a kind of general comment with, you know, if people want to respond. Dirk, I hadn't wanted to tell you this, but I'm afraid that's a I'm toast. <laughs> 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 Did we have another before the great firing squad? If one thinks when did <laughs> the last movement begin? It began when Morty wrote his conservative critique of um, the, the, those legal, those, those biographies in 1972. And that was, in, and that was a very specific and concrete um, destruction um, which made space for the new. Um. I mean, well, my sense, start more seriously, is that um, I mean, so so I, I would say that we're not in a moment of destruction. That is to say, we're in a moment of so Kuhnian normal science, but in the best sense, right? And so and it may be that irregularities develop in the normal science, and you know, maybe sometime, and maybe near, maybe distant future, there'll be some revolutionary moment for overthrowing the Hartog and his friends. But I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I, I think we're, I don't know, I, I experience myself still celebrating the, the availability of, of the frameworks that we've, that we've got. Though, I mean, even then, it's really, it, it was very helpful in Paul's discussion, I thought, to have a sense of who he was building on and who, and where he was building space against others, and it, it, as opposed to the kind of abstraction one saw, one saw in, in, particularly yesterday, in some of the discussions. Um, Chris Schmidt. Yeah, this is for, uh, for Lauren. Uh, it's one of your projects to talk about the legal history of localism, something that perhaps we haven't done enough of. And it seems that your description of what this legal history of localism would look like points in a very different direction. That one is at once very vague and inconsistent, and that's one of the characteristics of local legalism. At the same time, you talk uh, often about a local logic. There is some sort of coherency, perhaps, to this. So I was wondering um, if there is some kind of logic to this, and where did that come from? If there is sort of pervasive inconsistency, and if there's this decentralized sort of bottom up creation of these legal systems, where does this logic even come from? Uh, and then also, just more generally, what is distinctive about local law? Is there something generalizable we can take from this that perhaps then inform our understanding of law when we go back? maybe the more traditional subjects of legal history or something that we can bring with us from your work? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, it actually raises, I think, interesting things that I'm not quite sure how to answer, but I, I, I'm, I think there are actually dynamics in localized law that are very similar across time, or across spaces. So while in any given case, particular cases will be decided based on very specific kinds of local knowledge, the actual process by which this is done is incredibly consistent. So yeah, the process itself is where the logic lies. And the way that this is done, the way that people come and present their information and their knowledge about what's going on, the sort of the rituals that are involved in this where people all gather together, they air all of this, they repeat things, they say things over and over and over, just like I did, they repeat, they say them over and over. Um, they arrive at a conclusion, and then there is some contestation of sometimes of this conclusion. But the, it's interesting because we sort of assume usually that the conclusion is somehow the event, and in this instance, the conclusion is the anti-event because it's already sort of been decided by the time you get to that point. And so the logic of what's going on here takes place in the process itself. Now, where that comes from is really interesting, and this is where I think I may like be undercutting myself in some ways. Um, the logic is partly through processes that are laid down and widely known, right? Where do these processes come from? They obviously come from some centralized space. Um, and these processes were laid down actually many you know, hundreds of years ago, and they use a lot of the, the text from you know, defining what an English magistrate should do. Um, so these do come from some place. That said, it is widely known to the point where people aren't entirely sure where that comes from anymore, and it circulates through the community, actually emerges through people's interactions with each other. 
And we don't usually think of that as a legal logic because we're focused on the outcomes, we want the principles. But I think here, part of the legal logic is not just the process, but its ability to incorporate a wide range of things. So part of this logic is um, the promiscuousness of localized law, its refusal to define and identify a strict body of legal texts, a strict body of legal principles that are defined by certain people, but to look at things more broadly, to include the Bible, a novel, what mom said, and appellate cases, uh, sort of uh, this broad range of, of issues are drawing on legal principles, but in a way that will produce this outcome that coordinates with how people understand justice in their local areas. I think that's actually a logic that coheres, and I think it describes a lot of legal situations over spaces, which is really interesting. So it's not completely chaotic. It's not without some sort of internal processes and understandings and principles guiding this. And I think that we should, to me, that makes sense that we should take account of that as being part of something that's law, partly because these people think it is law, too. Um, they don't necessarily think that the things that we identify as law are just the law. They're thinking much more broadly about it, and I think that taking them a little bit more seriously as how they see the law is useful. It sort of as an aside to that, too, to speak to Bob's comment. Um, I don't think that this does go away. Um, but I think it inhabits different spaces, it has different kinds of authority and power at different kinds of moments. And in this particular moment, it seems like this has a great deal of power and authority, perhaps much more so to represent how people see the law than other iterations of law. And that this then may be the place to generalize, that can represent how people understand the law. Barbara. Uh, initially, just a just give it a sec, it perks up. Okay. Uh, the film, Laura Nader's film, Little Injustices, which is uh, just a dispute resolutions in this small town in Mexico where her research was based and, and how that gets transformed over a period of time, it strikes me that, that in part, part of what you're talking about is a system of dispute resolution. Uh, and so I'm kind of interested in the distinction between dispute resolution and, and law. Um, and then uh, a question for Mariana. I, I'm wondering whether this phrase, the honor of the crown, uh, is if you're seeing it used in other kinds of cases that, that, that don't deal with indigenous land rights, and whether all of the kinds of contexts in which it would come up would involve territory. Um, I asked a colleague who's sort of an expert in the history of constitutional law, including English constitutional law. He says the honor of the crown, something that he only found, and he actually went looking for it. Um, he only found it once in some obscure case where somebody was suing the crown for unpaid debts to merchants, um, which is sort of interesting because, of course, you know, debts of honor, if you read, uh, you know, 19th century Victorian three decades, debts of honor are always precisely not the ones to merchants, but gambling debts. <laughs> so, well, but, I mean, it, it doesn't have a lot of other, at least as far as I know, it doesn't have a lot of other current manifestations. I mean, I'm, I'm sure historically it does, and I was precisely looking for it, well, what else does the owner of the Crown do? can do so much. Uh, but I haven't found, I don't know. I mean, maybe Kunal knows some I obscure think, case I law on this. Not, not sort of being a fan of throwing out trivia, but on this point. Um, <laughs> that it's interesting. No, the, trivia is good. Computer, John's the right. Phrase, the I love trivia. The crown is actually used in uh, justice, um, sorry, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, justice story descent in the Charles River Bridge case, right? So he's sort of very famous case that um, in every American real story. Or claims to know. Um, so, and where he says, in fact, that the rule according to which the government should, in fact, protect the investment of the Charter of British Company and not, you know, essentially render it valueless by chartering another competitive bridge um, comes from an old English rule where the honor of the crown requires that when you, in fact, when the government engages in a contract with an individual, uh, it must protect that investment. Um, so, and I just look, and the phrase he uses, in fact, the phrase the honor of the crown. And does it work as a legal fiction? Well, he wouldn't say quite that 
But, but he prefers to in fact as a sort of settled rule or settled principle, uh, where the government sort of projects the investments of people with whom it bargains, you know, in, 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 a, in an arm's length way, right? To, dis to distinguish from where grants flow from the bounty of the ground, in which case the government could then override the funds. So, sorry, so I just wanted to interject that. Mm. Yeah. Can I do the dispute resolution? Were you asking me that? Well, it's just the, the film came into my mind when you we were asking about other examples. Right. Uh, Can I actually, I think it's yeah. really interesting because there is, there is this moment in a lot of these local cases where people move from dispute resolution and they say then they're taking it too long. And they make this transition in their mind. And I think this is really crucial in understanding why this is to them law and how they're thinking of this in a very different way. Dispute resolution, people get together and they're like, okay, so you know, you, you messed up my fence, here I'll give you a bucket of corn and you give me a hog, whatever, right? And, uh, or you rape my daughter, or you need to give me whatever. And then there's a moment where that falls apart or it isn't, it isn't, it isn't going to work. And then people say, no, I'm taking it to law. And I actually use that term, which is interesting. That there is this moment then where people go from a dispute resolution to something where they're taking it to this more sort of mystical uh, place where the law becomes, has authority. And they've made that distinction and move in their own mind. And it's interesting that all these people then who do this actually also follow the rules. They follow the rules, they abide by this, they very much believe in what they're doing, that it has authority. And I think all of that is exactly what we mean oftentimes when we're talking, and what has come up repeatedly in this conference too, about what the law is. It has some authority beyond those individuals, and those people do see it that way, even as they're the people who are, who are constituting this. And that is their language too. Um, and so they, they see that they're following the <coughs> principles. They see that this is something to them that is lawful. So we are coming to the end of the allotted time. I know there are lots of conversation that could continue to happen, and indeed I hope will continue to happen over cocktails at the law school, but before you race out of your seat and go get a drink, um, <laughs> there are two things remaining to be done. One, thank the panel, hang on. The other is Chris, Tomlins wants to have a few moments, I want Chris to have a few moments to uh, wrap up and then that'll launch us off to cocktails. So first join me in thanking the panel. Thank you all, thank you all for being here. Thank you to this panel. Thank you to each of the panels. Um, much has been said. Uh, there should remain little to be said. Uh, in a sense, this is uh, a time of ending. Um, I want to say uh, that uh, two things we have, we have done. We have talked about, in a sense, two problematics problematic of law and the problematic of law as uh, I phrase them as problematics because part of the objective I think was to take something that perhaps we have taken for granted a formulation that perhaps we may have become a little complacent about and we have subjected it to an examination by counterposing a different problematic, a different formulation. Thus, we have, we may have enlivened it. We may have, and some of us may have rejected it. Some of us may have accepted it again in a different sense. Um, for myself, speaking purely for myself, uh, thinking of how I think of history, one way of uh, in which I think of history is a kind of movie strip, uh, and by that I mean not as a movie, but as a movie strip. Uh, a succession of images uh, arranged in a certain sequence that need not be the only sequence, um, but that uh, effectively uh, expresses um, something that I am striving to move toward in my own work, which is a, 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 an idea that is uh, integral to 
um, Walter Benjamin's um, own sense of history, uh, which he termed uh, dialectics at a standstill. Um, that is the moment, the frozen moment that one freezes to inspect. Uh, that is how I think uh, law as is distinct from the motion of uh, law and. Um, we've had a lot of about uh, being men over the last two days. It's interesting to me that we have done so. Uh, some of us are Benny ministers, some are not. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, one thing uh, that's, that's interesting to me is that that name should have arisen quite frequently. Um, uh, one does not hear uh, Walter Benjamin's name very much in meetings of American historians. Um, uh, perhaps that means that uh, a uh, judicious admixture of others is not a bad idea. Um, we've created a conference um, with friends, um, both old friends and some new friends. Um, many of these participants have uh, come far, have worked very hard, have given us their time, uh, their energy, uh, some have paid their own way so that others could come. Um, and I think I would like to ask you all, please, just to thank all of our participants for what we have had from them in the last two days. Thank you all very much. Now, what would law be without perception? <laughs> and so in a couple of minutes, we will assemble on the plaza outside, and we will move to law as perception. <laughs> but because this is an ending, endings are always sad, um, particularly when so many have come from far away and leaving, um, sad because they are completions, and so to interrupt the ending and the completion, because I'm reluctant to see you all go, uh, I thought I'd end with a story, a short story, not too long, I promise you, a story about a beginning that touches on some of the themes I think that we have been discussing, themes of, of drama and depiction, Themes of logos and gnomus, themes of resistance and lies, themes of myths and enchantments, of empires and law, and a few brute facts. It begins on the 14th of February in 1613 in London, uh, where Princess Elizabeth, the 17 year old daughter of James I and Anne of Denmark, married Frederick V. Prince Elector of the Rhineland Pfalz, that is the Rhenish Palatinate. Um, after their marriage, Elizabeth left England for Frederick's court in Heidelberg and never returned. Now, in the old Europe, writes Francis Yates, a royal wedding is a diplomatic event of the first importance, and festivities of royal weddings were statements of policy. And on the 15th of February, immediately following the wedding ceremony, on the 14th, festivities were dominated by a mask, the memorable mask of the two honorable inns of court, the Middle Temple and Lincoln's Inn, a mask written by George Chapman and staged by Inigo Jones. Mask, as I'm sure many of you know, is an elaborate form of court entertainment, uh, particularly popular in Tudor Stuart, Stuart England. It combined music, dance, song, acting, elaborate costume, elaborate staging. James I was a known aficionado. And like carnival and pageant, mask was primarily allegorical. It was a narrative. It was hugely expensive. It flattered its patrons 
with displays of conspicuous consumption that conveyed the richness and importance of a court that would be demeaned by anything less elaborate and costly. A fully elaborated mask would normally contain a, a, a subversive counter theme, an anti-mask, that was intended to create a contrast to the mask's main narrative, one that would be resolved in a concluding display of order and magnificence, uh, usually one that centered on the presence of the monarch. That was the mask's fulfillment, this final display. It was to lead spectators to a fuller understanding through contemplating an image which would impress upon them the power and the, and the um, the glory of the spectacle and of the patron to whom the spectacle was directed. The theme of the memorable mask of the two honorable inns of court was Virginia. It began with a fortunate parade of masked participants from the inns of court to the royal palace of Whitehall. The torchbearers, wrote Chapman in his notes, should be of Indian garb. The chief maskers likewise richly attired in Indian habits and altogether estrangeful and Indian-like. The visards, that is their faces, their faces should be of olive color but pleasingly visaged. Their hair should be black and large. It should wave down to their shoulders. Each should be intended by two moors attired like Indian slaves. The whole should escort two cars triumphal bearing Virginian priests by whom the sun is there adored, and therefore they shall be called the Thebaids. Arriving at Whitehall, the maskers presented themselves as Indian princes come to England to honor the marriage of Princess Elizabeth. Now at its surface, the mask displays Virginian obeisance to the English crown. The narrative is somewhat more complex. The story the mask tells is of a troop of noble Virginians born to Britain by the effects of the motions of the earth on their island, a huge golden rock. Come from one of the most remote parts of the world, brought to touch, I'm quoting, at this all exceeding island, that is Britain which though itself an island did not move, but was divided from the world. So that though the whole world besides moves, yet this isle stands fixed on her own feet and defies the world's mutability. The Virginian princes uh, came attending the god of riches, Pluto, all triumphantly shining in a mine of gold. For hearing, wrote, Chapman, of the most royal solemnity of these sacred nuptials, they crossed the ocean in their honor, and now here they are arrived. Upon their arrival, the goddess Honor appears from her British temple, attended by the priestess Eunomia, the sacred power of law, and Honor addresses Pluto thus. Those whom I made cross the Britain Ocean to this most famed isle of all the world to do due homage to the sacred nuptials of law and virtue celebrated here by this hour of the holy even I know are ready to perform the rites they owe to setting Phoebus, that is, to the sun, which their first act advances. Now the Phoebids, that is, the priests of the sun, then appear, and as the Virginian mine opens, to reveal its riches within, they begin to sing three hymns of worship to the setting sun. Then as they sing the second hymn, Anna speaks again, not in counterpoint, as it were, not in complementarity, but in interruption. This superstitious hymn sung to the sun, let us encounter with fit duties done to our dear Phoebus, whose true piety enjoys from heaven an earthly deity. And a, a distinct competing chorus begins to intervene, and it is directed not like the Virginian chorus toward the setting sun, but it is directed toward the person of the king. 
and it goes as follows. Rise, rise, Phoebus, ever rise. Descend not to the inconstant stream, but grace with endless light our skies. To thee that sun is but a beam. Oh, may our sun not set before he sees his endless sea arise and deck his triple crowned shore with springs of human deities. So as these new voices sing, the Virginian priests, the Phoebids, they continue their hymns to the setting sun, and the two choruses vie one against the other in a discordant competition. And finally, the priests complete their refrain, and they fall silent, at which point Honor directs the second chorus to conclude your song to him to whom all Phoebus beams belong. And the voices respond, Rise still, dear sun, never set, but be to earth her only light. All other kings in thy beams met are clouds and dark effects of night, as when the rosy morn doth rise, like mists all give thy wisdom way. A learned king is, as in skies, to pour dim stars the flaming day. And as this chorus dies away, Eunomia takes stage and she addresses the Virginians. Eunomia, recall, is the priestess of law. Virginian princes, you must now renounce your superstitious worship of these sons, subject to cloudy darkenings and descents, and your sweet devotions turn the events to this our Britain, Phoebus, whose bright skies enlightened with a Christian piety, is never subject to black error's night, and hath already offered heaven's true light to your dark region, which acknowledge now to send unto him all your homage vow. And then all join in harmony, a final harmony, to celebrate the nuptials of Elizabeth and her young bridegroom. This is a high moment of state, a major celebration of dynastic order. And at this moment, the memorable mask enacts sovereign possession of Virginia by this our Britain Phoebus, that is, of course, James I, as the overthrow of magic and myth and superstition and the beginning of law. The mask represents Virginia as an island of riches that has floated across the Atlantic and touched upon the immovable island of Britain where it fetches up, attaches itself, and becomes Britain's possession. Tellingly, the mask's interior conflict and how it is resolved, the conflict that is between the priest's hymns of worship to the setting sun and the countercourse that directs its praises to the ever-rising son of King James, Honor, of course, sees to the ascendancy of the counter-chorus, but the final emphatic resolution of the conflict between anti-mask and mask, the final, hence, emergence of the mask's intended meaning, awaits the final intervention of Eunomia, who commands the silent Virginians to turn away from their son and henceforth direct their devotions towards James. Thus, law begins England's Virginia as the conquest of myth. Now, I will offer no profound observations on the deep meanings of this story. Uh, I will only say that it helped me end a book that I had been writing for some years. Um, but in thinking about this story, and the companions that it has in that book, and what they say about me as a scholar. Uh, I conclude uh, that I'm a bit of a jackdaw. Uh, I like collecting things. And that if this conference had a theme or a purpose in my mind, it was a jackdaw's purpose. Uh, it was, as it were, a collection of juxtapositions and intersections. My jackdaw mentality is what draws me to Walter Benjamin, I think, because like Benjamin, I collect things. One of the things I collect is epigraphs. And so if we need an epigraph for this conference, and epigraphs, as you know, come with beginnings, 
So this is an epigraph for an ending, which will therefore not be an ending, but a, be but a beginning. Uh, let it be this one, which I had just collected only a few minutes ago from the back jacket of a book that John Comroff has just shown me, uh, a book by his son, Joshua. Uh, the book is, I think, suitably entitled for our purposes, Monstrous Intersections. And the epigraph is, the sleep of pragmatism breeds monsters. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.